The Editor's Preface to the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925, a forecast written in the year 1763. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925, a forecast written in the year 1763 by Samuel Madden. The Editor's Preface Of late years it has been common enough for authors to comment on the political and social tendencies of their own day by drawing fancy pictures of the state of the world many generations hence, when these tendencies have been worked out to their full development. From Lord Lytton's Coming Race, published in 1871, down to Mr. Bellamy's Looking Backward, and Mr. Wells's When the Sleeper Wakes, at least a dozen books have been written on these lines but till last year I was not aware how far back the catena of this prophetical literature could be followed. Working through the wrecks of an eighteenth-century library in the old world town of Burford, I came upon the reign of George the Sixth, a little book of 192 pages, issued anonymously as long ago as 1763. As it deals with the years 1900 to 1925, there seems to be a special appropriateness in republishing it just as the period of which it treats is coming upon us. The reader will, I think, allow that the interest of its contents is sufficient to justify its reissue for his benefit. There is a good deal of amusement, as well of instruction, to be got from studying this forecast of the history of our own time, drawn four generations ago by an acute political thinker of the early years of George the Third. Like all books of its kind, the reign of George the Sixth has two sides. The author was not merely exercising the faculty of prophecy according to his lights, but was intending to influence the men of his own day by pointing out, in the actions of his puppets, George the Sixth, the Dukes of Bedford and Suffolk, and the rest, what ought to be done and what avoided in the year of grace 1763. In domestic politics he was a Tory. His nightmare was the perpetuation of that battle of the kites and crows the objectless strife of the Whig factions, which had endured for the last two generations. His panacea was the more active interference of the king with his ministers, and the recent doings of George the Third had much encouraged him. Like the monarch whom he would fain advise, he must have been reading Bolingbroke's Patriot King, and dreaming of the realization of its ideals. Unfortunately the young sovereign from whom he hopes so much is not the farmer George of reality but a sort of more amiable Frederick the Great, a heaven-sent general who is also an enthusiastic patron of arts and letters. Did our author, we wonder, survive to learn the modesty of King George's military aspirations, or to hear of his interesting literary criticism as to Shakespeare's works being sad stuff, only one must not say so? In foreign affairs we find from the first page of the book to the last only two main ideas— Russia is the bugbear of the future. Unless her wings are clipped, she will dominate all northern and eastern Europe and become the bully of the world. We find that in 1900 she has not only devoured Poland and Finland and the Crimea and all her actual conquests, but has also annexed the two Scandinavian monarchies, a thing that appeared by no means impossible to an observer of 1763, when Gustavus III had not yet arisen to put an end to the internal factions of the larger northern realm. But if Russia is the great danger of the future to our author, France is the great danger of the present. She is unteachable and irreconcilable, and she must be smashed. There is no other way of dealing with her, and after two of her gratuitous attacks George the Sixth accomplishes, with what seems to us astounding ease, the complete conquest of the Bourbon realm. We leave France held down by English garrisons and governed by an Anglo-French regency, as she had been in the days of Henry V and his unfortunate son. Apparently our author finds finality in the carrying out of this rather drastic policy. He had so badly gauged French patriotic sentiment that he imagined that the nation could be bribed into acquiescence in foreign conquest by a liberal dose of trial by jury, habeas corpus, and the liberty of the press pages 102 to 105. The French seemed to enjoy these benefits with a particular exultation, as they came from the hand of their conqueror. Happy for France that it was conquered by such a patriot king. 
There is a strangely modern touch in the insistence of our author on the fact that England's greatest danger lies in the combination against her of Russia and France. It argues considerable penetration that he should have worked out for 1901 a crisis of this kind, a thing that is quite within the limits of the probable. In 1763 Russian politics were unscrupulous enough, but it was not very obvious that they would lead to the building up of the great empire which has since arisen. For when our author wrote, Catherine the Second had but just come to her ill-gotten throne, and had given no clear promise of her after-career, while her predecessors since Peter the Great had been creatures of very common clay. Nevertheless, the future of Russia is accurately foreseen. Indeed, her coming greatness is even overstated, for in 1900 she has made the second, instead of the third, naval power in Europe, and her land dominions, as we have already remarked, are made to extend to the North Sea, instead of merely to the Gulf of Finland. Looking round the rest of Europe, we find in our prophecy much that has been fulfilled, as well as much that is hopelessly wrong. The Turk is still at Constantinople, though his northern borders have been clipped close by Russia. Page 28. The supremacy in Germany has passed from the Habsburgs to the House of Brandenburg, and Frederick the Ninth of Hohenzollern, a weak prince governed by his queen, holds the imperial title in 1900. A political prophet, fresh from witnessing the glories of Frederick the Great, might venture on such a forecast, but he is not happy in making it the result of a marriage, a thing most unlikely to occur between the heir of the Protestant Hohenzollerns and the heiress of the Catholic Habsburgs. No one could possibly have foreseen the actual details of the great change in Central Europe. The suppression in 1805 of the old Holy Roman Empire by Napoleon, born six years after our book was written, and the creation, sixty-five years later, of the new Deutsch Reich under William I of Prussia. The Germany of 1900, as our author sees it, is a perpetuation of the Elder Empire, not a newly formed state. Electors of Bavaria and Hanover, Dukes of Saxony and similar princes of the 18th century sort, are its chief moving powers. How, by the way, Hanover has got separated from England, and has an elector again while yet the male line of the gulf survives on this side of the channel, we are never told. Presumably it is a result of some of the unfortunate wars of George V, vaguely hinted at on page 3. Italian unity was another of the events of the future which our author foresaw. Nearly all the peninsula is under one king in 1900. Turin, Milan, Rome, and Naples all obey the same master. The patrimony of St. Peter had long been wrested from the church, and the temporal power of the popes is over. But two unfortunate forecasts are made in sketching the Italy of 1900. Its king is not a member of the House of Savoy, but a descendant of Charles of Naples, the bustling and well-served Don Carlos, whose successes our author must have had in his head when he conceived the idea, so grotesquely impossible to us, of a Sicilian Bourbon seated on the Roman throne. The other failure in his prophecy is the survival of a small Venetian state in northeastern Italy. A king of uncertain origin rules instead of a doge at Venice, and his existence has been prolonged by the aid of France, who has always found her account in intermeddling with the affairs of Italy. Page 11. The history of the Iberian Peninsula has not been so happily foreshadowed by our author as that of the Italian. It was permissible for a contemporary of our vigorous enemy Charles the Third, who did as much for Spain as he did for Naples, to believe that the realm of the younger Bourbon house had still some possibilities of revival in her. So the nineteenth-century history of Spain is no miserable story of Godoys and Esporteros, but fairly prosperous. Portugal is conquered and absorbed somewhere early in the century, and Sardinia has returned to the Spanish allegiance apparently when the rest of the dominions of the House of Savoy, in common with the other Italian states, were annexed by the victorious Bourbon king of the two Sicilies. It will strike the reader as strange to find that Spain has also contrived to recover Gibraltar, page 85, and apparently Menorca also, so that Great Britain has no foothold left in the Mediterranean. Moreover, the whole of Spain's American empire is intact. Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela are not the spawning ground of dictators and pronunciamentos, but peaceful and supine viceroyalties under the Bourbon crown. 
with little fighting power in them. Brazil, in consequence of the conquest of Portugal, has become a Spanish province, like the great lands to the west and south of it. It is hard for us, to whom the rebellion of the colonies is an only too well-known phenomenon, to conceive how unlikely it must have appeared to an observer of 1763, that the great possessions in the New World would ever develop a national spirit, and cut themselves adrift from their mother countries. Spain, it is to be noted, is not only still dominant in America, but has retained the Philippines, which formed the goal of an English invasion in 1920. Of the minor states of Europe as they stood in 1763, our author has allowed few to survive. He was a consistent believer in the idea that they were destined to be absorbed by their larger neighbors. The Swiss Confederation is still in existence, page 64, but no other third-rate power save the imaginary kingdom of Venice. Portugal has been devoured by Spain, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, no less than Poland, by Russia, while France, somewhere about 1850, has overrun and annexed the Austrian Netherlands and Holland. The Dutch, whose spirits were sunk in their slavery, had no inclination to assist their cruel masters, but they were kept too much in awe by the French garrisons in their several fortresses to listen to a deliverer. The minor Italian states save Venice have been incorporated long ere 1900 in the enlarged kingdom ruled by the Neapolitan Bourbons. That the 19th century would see the creation of half a dozen new principalities in the Balkan Peninsula our author did not dream. He makes the Sultan still master of all the lands as far as the Danube. We have left the description of France to the last as it is the continental state on which most attention is bestowed. The French Revolution is an event of which our author has not the remotest foreboding. The France of 1900 is to him still the centralized, ill-governed despotism of his own day. The nobility were absolute lords on their own estates, but the slaves of their monarch and the first to bear his fury. Page 104. The Parlement had formerly raised commotions in this kingdom by their obstinacy in refusing to register the royal edicts. But this appearance of liberty was now entirely at an end. Superstition and enthusiasm rule the lower classes, only tempered after 1920 by the great number of books that swarmed from the press, which ridiculed and subverted the Roman Catholic religion. The towns had in many provinces fallen into decay. The state was half ruined, but a cunning and political prince, King Charles X, is still pursuing the aggressive policy of his ancestor Louis the Fourteenth keeping Italy astir, preying on the ill-compacted German Empire, and oppressing millions of discontented Netherlanders. In alliance with his confederate, Tsar Peter IV, he is able to dominate Europe, till engaging in an unprovoked war with England he loses both his life and his crown in 1919. Finally, national spirit is so dead, as we have already remarked, that at the end of the disastrous struggle with George the Sixth. The French monarchy is content to endure a permanent foreign garrison and to be governed by a foreign regency. Let us hope that our author was still a young man in 1763 and survived for a quarter of a century to witness the outburst of 1789 and the wars of 1792 to 97. Turning from the continent to our own realm, we find much to astonish us in the England of 1900. The feature which will most amuse the reader is the state of our domestic politics. We are still in the midst of 18th century factions and parliamentary corruption. The fate of ministries depends on the intrigues of a nod of Whig dukes, each provided with his following in the lower house. The most objectionable and unpatriotic of them is the Duke of Bedford, a personage obviously modeled on that prince of jobbers, Thomas Hollis, Duke of Newcastle, whom a Tory writer of the early years of George III might well take as his bait in war. Like Newcastle in 1762, this nobleman sticks at the head of the treasury in a cabinet which is anxious to get rid of him, but has to endure him because of his prodigious parliamentary interest. He intrigues against his colleagues, sets his hirelings in the commons to vote against the ministry, and finally chooses the moment of an invasion of England to force the dismissal of his rivals on the king. Page 17. This is the precise line of conduct which Newcastle adopted in 1745-46, to when he bullied George II into getting rid of Carteret by resigning his office, just as the Jacobite rising was at its height, and the French were reported to be embarking at Dunkirk. 
It ultimately requires a sort of coup d'etat on the king's part to get rid of the baneful influence of this unpatriotic statesman. His Majesty descends on the Commons, much as Charles I attempted to do on January the 4th, 1642, and gives them a sound rating, accompanied by many vague threats. Thereupon the overawed assembly forget their terror of the Duke, and grant his irate master the subsidies that he demands. A beautiful sidelight on the possibilities of eighteenth-century politics is given by the fact that before declaring war on England, Tsar Peter IV had conveyed immense sums into the kingdom, and had most politically distributed them to the most advantageous purposes. He had secured a large party, and this obstructed every measure proposed for coming to some speedy resolutions. Page 17. Reading this, we fancy that we are in the days of Charles II rather than those of George III. But evidently a hot partisan in 1763 might still believe that those who differed from him on external politics had been bought with foreign gold. French politicians of the more excitable sort are under the same impression today. Looking through the lists of the old cabinets of the 18th century, we are often surprised to note the enormous proportion of the ministers who sat in the upper house. But we are bound to say that our author overdoes the matter in absolutely reigning dukes upon us. In the first ministry of George the Sixth, 1900, the Duke of Bedford was continued as Lord High Treasurer. The Duke of Northumberland was removed from being President of the Council and succeeded by the Earl of Surrey, son of the Duke of Norfolk. The Duke of Marlborough was made Secretary of State for the Southern Department, and the Duke of Suffolk Lord Privy Seal in the room of the Duke of St. Albans, while the Duke of Grafton became First Lord of the Admiralty, a post just vacant by the death of the Duke of Atoll. Page 6. On a first reading of this book I had fancied that the Duke of Suffolk, the right-hand man of King George the Sixth, was a reflection of Lord Bute, but I fancy that this cannot be so. Our author, though a sincere Tory, is very bitter against Butte's Peace of Paris, concluded a few months before he wrote his pamphlet. Our late peace, he writes, was not altogether so advantageous as ministerial writers would have us think, and our moderation was rather a little ill-timed. Preface, page 31. Nor was Butte either originally of a mean family, or one who had travelled through the principal courts of Europe and understood all their interests, and connections with abundance of ease and perspicuity. Page 7. I conclude, then, that Suffolk represents the minister whom George the Third ought to have met, rather than the one who is actually in power when this book was written. It is very strange to find no trace of William Pitt in our author's prophecy, all the more so that his policy is entirely inspired by that of the great commoner. The entire beating down of France, the seizure of the Spanish possessions in the East and West Indies, the development of the American colonies, the perpetual increase of the fleet are all Pitt's ideas. Yet among the ministers of George the Sixth, there is certainly no one who in the least adumbrates the great statesman who had been thrust from power only a year before this book appeared. Was the author under the impression that George the Third disliked his mighty subject to such an extent that it would be useless to urge a reconciliation? Or was he content that Pitt's ideas should be carried out even if Pitt himself should not be entrusted with their realization? That the political England of 1900 is practically that of 1763 is most clearly visible in the budgets which the ministers of George the Sixth present to their parliaments. Our author has no conception of the enormous increase of national wealth which was to swell our revenue, within a century, to eight or ten times that of his own day. Or rather, he foresaw a large development both of trade and of manufactures, but forgot that such a movement would translate itself into figures. He is perpetually harping on the dangerous swelling of the national debt all through the nineteenth century, and more especially in the reign of George the Fourth, Page 3. But when we examine the enormous burden, which must very soon drive the nation to come to the sponge, we find that it amounted in 1900 to no more than 211 million pounds. In 1763 it was standing at about 140 million pounds, so that our author imagined that the addition of some 70 million pounds more would be a fair estimate for the next century. What would he have said if he had been informed that in January 1816 it would amount to over 900 million pounds, and that the mere interest on it in that year would be more than double his total estimate for the annual revenue of the United Kingdom. 
the very modest total to which the receipts of the exchequer were to amount in 1900, is 14 million pounds, a sum that would have astonished all the world had we not been in possession of such a flourishing commerce. As a matter of fact, it seems probable that the real estimates for that year will amount to between eight and nine times our author's calculation. Looking into the details, the Army, Navy, and Civil Service each cost in 1899 just about eight times the sum indicated in the detailed budget set forth on page 33. On the other hand, the money required for the management of the national debt is less than six times the four million two hundred fifty thousand pounds which our author allows for it in 1900. He had estimated that financial stress would have cut down the four percents of his own day to two percents by the time of George the Sixth. As a matter of fact, we have come down to two and three quarters percent but by the peaceful method of conversion, and not by the violent shock of the repudiation of half the covenanted interest. Our author, like most eighteenth-century writers, was a great exponent of the all-importance of trade and colonization. The financial salvation of Great Britain, he tells us, is bound up with the development of our North American colonies. The immense region of country which the English there possessed was what most extended and forwarded the British manufactures. Of Australia and South Africa there is, naturally enough, no mention in the book. The first settlement in the former was a quarter of a century in the future, 1788. In the latter there was only an obscure Dutch colony at the Cape. The East India Company is still flourishing, but the limits of its territories are nowhere stated. We only know that in the reign of George the Sixth they comprised not only Indian possessions, but Batavia and the former Dutch settlements in Java. The company is found in 1920 aiding the king with a fleet as well as with a powerful land army, page 86. But North America was to be the great land of promise. By the year 1920, there were 11 million of souls in the British American dominions. They were in possession of perhaps the finest country in the world and yet had never made the least attempt to shake off the authority of Great Britain, page 100. It is a minor point to note that the United States have now about 70 million inhabitants, and the Dominion of Canada well over 5 million. The really interesting fact in our author's picture is to see that he had just conceived of the possibility of a revolt of the United Colonies, and then rejected it. George Grenville's unhappy legislation was still in the future, though quite close at hand. It began indeed less than a twelve-month after our pamphlet was printed. Other American grievances were already in existence, but our author gives his reasons for thinking that they would never grow dangerous. The constitutions of the several divisions of this vast monarchy were admirably designed to keep the whole in continual dependence on the mother country. The multiplicity of governments which prevailed over the whole country rendered the execution of such a scheme, combined rebellion, absolutely impossible. Page 100 alas for paper guarantees it was in all probability well within our author's lifetime that the spectacle of an intercolonial congress was to give his speculations the lie the chances are that he survived to hear of saratoga and yorktown and to see an envoy of the united states of north america walking in the streets of london he must have sighed to think of his own enthusiastic picture of ten british men-of-war on the stocks at once in boston harbor page sixty five and of the militia of New Orleans cooperating with our redcoats in the capture of the city of Mexico. Page 86. The great development of British commerce and manufactures which our author foresaw was to be accomplished, of course, without the aid of steam. Three-deckers fight our naval battles. Huge East Indiamen bring us the wealth of Calcutta and Batavia. Internal communications are facilitated by splendidly kept high roads and numberless canals, not by the locomotive or the steamer. Living in the heyday of canals, the great Bridgewater Canal started work in 1761. Our author looked on them as the great highways of the future. Rivers that formerly were almost useless were now navigated by large barges which increased the trade of innumerable towns, and raised in many places new ones. The canals which were cut joined rivers, and formed a communication between every part of the kingdom. Villages grew into towns, and towns became cities. Page 99. But the growth of great towns, though it gratified the economical side of our author's mind, did not please the artistic side. 
Accordingly, we find that George the Sixth, like the Reverend Robert Spaulding, did not like London. Its prodigious size was its only boast. It contained few buildings that did honor to the nation. The meanness of His Majesty's palace disgusted him. In a word, he thought London a fine city calculated for trade, but not for the residence of the polite arts. Accordingly, he built a sort of Versailles in the Midlands, to which he removed the law courts, the parliament, and all the public offices. Our author waxes enthusiastic over the beauties of the new city of Stanley, which was laid out by the royal architects on a regular and symmetrical plan. The façade of each street was carefully settled, and the erectors of houses were compelled to conform to the design. In 1763 we were in the full tide of classical architecture, and Stanley must be conceived as filled entirely with domes and pediments and peristyles. Its cathedral far exceeded St. Peter's Rome. Its forty-three parish churches were no doubt in the style of St. George's Hanover Square, its colleges on the lines of Queen's College, Oxford, its enormous palace modeled on that of a German residence. We fear that to the real denizen of the year 1900 the city would be a nightmare, with its monotonous thoroughfares and its public buildings all in one single style. The description of the great gardens running down to the Welland and looking out on Rockingham Forest sounds more promising, though we cannot but smile when we read of the landscape in which the appearance of art was entirely banished. For our author's idea of nature unadorned included artificial mountains crowned with little temples and pinnacles, a prodigious quantity of masonry, and many cascades tumbling down artificial rocks till they lost themselves in meandering currents through the embrowning shades. Page 96. From the fact that the imaginary city of Stanley is reared in Rutland, not far from Uppingham, and close by the banks of the Welland, I conclude that our author must have been a native or at least a denizen of that part of the Midlands. This fact may be of assistance in the identification of his personality, which I have not been able to discover. Literary men interested in the county of Rutland can never have been very numerous. The reader will notice with interest on pages 37 and 94 the account of the creation and endowment by George the Sixth of royal academies not only of arts and architecture, but of literature. Our author has been good enough to give us a list of the original members of these institutions, which is not without interest. Oddly enough, his leading poet bears the name of Reynolds, which in 1763, one would have thought, must have been already associated with art rather than with literature. That great man united the elegance of Mason with the genius of Shakespeare. His colleague Pine, to the inventive imagination of Milton, added the correctness and harmony of Pope. Third among the writers was Young, whose comedies far exceeded those of the celebrated Simons. We should gladly have welcomed a few screeds and excerpts from the works of these masters of the pen, but our author does not indulge us with a single quotation. It is to be feared that, if he had done so, we should have found that they were written in the highest classical style of the eighteenth century. The romantic revival was still in the future when the reign of George the Sixth was written. The only authors who are quoted in the book are historians. Stevenson, who apparently wrote on continental politics, and is cited for the foreign relations of Switzerland, page 64, and Duchamp, a French writer who seems to have dealt with the military aspect of the great struggle of 1917 to 1920. It must suffice us to know, in a general way, that the Royal Academy of Polite Learning refined the English language and promoted literature in all its branches. The prize is given every year for the best tragedies, comedies, and essays, at the same time that they raised a spirit of emulation, were a means of enriching the votaries of genius. It remains to add a few words concerning the military operations which occupy so great a space in the reign of George the Sixth. The reader will find that they are entirely modeled on the tactics of Frederick the Great, which have evidently been most carefully studied. The usual advance in two lines of infantry with the cavalry massed on the wings, the use of the oblique order and the regular turning of one of the adversary's flanks, are all copied from the great Hohenzollern. In his one disaster, his surprise by the French in front of Orléans in May 1919, George the Sixth does Frederick the honor of copying him even in defeat, for the battle seems modeled on that of Hawkirk. The marches of the English army are very carefully worked out and can be easily verified on the map. 
that to relieve Vienna in 1918 is a careful reproduction of Marvel's March to Blenheim, which was the sole precedent that lay before our author for an operation extending over such a vast stretch of country. The movements about Lyon and Clermont, ending in the Battle of Espalion, pages 75 to 79, will all bear careful verification, both for the roads traversed and for the time taken. But there can be no doubt that in some of the campaigns the limit of days allowed for long and complicated operations is too small. George the Sixth contrives to move with a rapidity that would have astonished Napoleon himself. Having, for example, won the Battle of Espalion on June 23, 1920, it is quite impossible that he should have cleared the French out of Languedoc, Guienne, Gascony, Provence, and Dauphine, and occupied Paris by the 24th of July. Our author states that he met practically no opposition in subduing the southern provinces, but as we are told that the King of France was waiting before him with an unbeaten army of some 80,000 men during the latter part of these operations, it is certain that such incredible speed could not have been reached. Page 83. I regret that I have been able to make no plausible guess as to the identity of the author of this little book. It was printed for W. Nicol at the paper mill in St. Paul's Churchyard late in 1763. That it achieved some popularity in its day is shown by the fact that an enterprising German publisher thought it worth while to have the pamphlet translated and reprinted at Leipzig as De Regrung George de Sexton. I had hoped that the translator might have added a preface giving some information as to the author, but he has contented himself with making a very literal rendering of the English without adding a single note or remark of his own. If any reader can put me on the track of a literary man of strong imperialistic proclivities, who flourished in 1763, and had a connection with the county of Rutland, and more especially the town of Uppingham, I should be much obliged for the information. C. Oman, Oxford, June 20th, 1899. End of the Editor's Preface. Recording by Philip Gould. The Author's Preface to the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925. A forecast written in the year 1763. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925, a forecast written in the year 1763 by Samuel Madden. The Author's Preface. A preface, like a master of the ceremonies, introduces two strangers to an interview, and upon occasions of this nature the bookseller usually officiates as Sir Clement Cotterell to the reader. Footnote. Master of the Ceremonies to George the Second and George the Third, from 1758 to 1774. End footnote. If we were to go on with our similes, we should compare an author to a convict at the place of execution. For let him have talked ever so much, he still has a last word to say to the public. With regard to the tendency of the following history, as it is taken up at a what's to come period and begun in an era that will not begin these hundred years, it may be necessary to say a few words, whether critical or explanatory, whimsical or elaborate, shall be entirely submitted to the determination of the reader. The Kingdom of Great Britain was divided into two powerful parties, as we are informed by our annals, when the great Dr. Swift took it into his head to write the history of Captain Lemuel Gulliver. The political tendency of that celebrated performance is too generally known to require any comment in this place. The dean, with the greatest concern, had long seen the distractions of the state, and knew that it would be utterly impossible in a direct chain of reasoning to combat with the force of popular opinion, or to contend with those obstinate prejudices which, in a course of ill-judged education, are too often and too fatally imbibed. Sensible of this ineffectuality, that great man set about an undertaking which would produce all the consequences he desired, without seeming to labor for any and fully expose the principles of faction without appearing the least solicitous to detect them at all. He wrote, he published, and succeeded, and the work is, at this day, one of the most masterly pieces of its kind in any language, and held in the highest estimation by the most sensible and judicious part of the kingdom. 
The modesty, which is ever the companion of true merit, would by no means admit your author to think of a parallel between this history and the travels of Captain Gulliver. Even to say he does not is a sort of presumption, as it is tacitly acknowledging the possibility of such a comparison. But the very same modesty induces him to hope that in the course of the following sheets the reader will not sit down to an entertainment utterly contemptible, for then it would be an unpardonable piece of ill-breeding to think of setting it before a guest. The generality of modern writers have a mighty trick of saying, to be sure they themselves are sensible the performance is trivial, poor, wants merit, and all that. But why, if they are sensible their productions are so very despicable, do they insolently think of offering them to the public? Why do they think of printing these very poor, trivial, and contemptible performances? Why? Why? Because? Because they neither think them poor, trivial, nor contemptible. Their very humility is nothing but an aggravation of their arrogance. For the greatest vanity a man was ever guilty of was to say he had no vanity at all. In the history of George the Sixth, we find few or none of those episodes or particular circumstances that might happen among the great men of his time. The historian has confined himself to the actions of the prince alone, and in the account of the exploits he little more than names any principal commander directing his whole attention to the conduct of the king. He paints him resolute, wise, and magnanimous at home, vigilant, intrepid, and fortunate abroad, successful against domestic factions and victorious over foreign enemies, a promoter of arts and sciences, an encourager of religion and virtue, and in short draws him a very great king and a truly good man. We shall not offer so poor a compliment to the reader as to mention any personage of the present age of English growth who deserves the character given to the hero of the future, but we shall very much pity his understanding if he meets with any difficulty in finding him out. In the course of the following sheets, the reader's own reflection must frequently assist him in the elucidation of particular circumstances, for in performances of this nature it is totally impossible to be always as clear as a person could wish. There are such things as an attorney and solicitor general, a court of king's bench and pains and penalties. It might be rather dangerous for the author to write with more perspicuity on some points, but there is no law hitherto established against thinking so that while he is secure from the acquaintance of a messenger, our author in any passage which may carry the appearance of obscure gives the reader leave to think just what he pleases of the relation. The great contest that has long subsisted between two powerful factions affords the fairest opportunity for a satirical reader to exert himself, and to lash any error that may be found in the principles of either, even while he writes with a laudable view of reconciling both. Our historian, in the gloomy portrait which he draws of the nation at the beginning of his work, alludes very strongly to a late dangerous crisis when the kingdom was torn with party feuds and animosities, and when some of the greatest people risked their own properties without any concern to enjoy the malevolent satisfaction of injuring other people. The character of the future Duke of Bedford will easily lead us to think of a nobleman of the present times, who is headed in opposition to the government of his king and the parliamentary proceedings in the reign of George the Sixth may be considered as a well-turned compliment to the legislature of George the Third. In the perusal of the ensuing history, the author has dealt with a particular satisfaction on the encouragement given to men of genius, and the noble provisions which his hero allowed for cultivating the politer arts and sciences. The academy which he established for that purpose endears the monarch imperceptibly to the reader of taste and was not injudiciously introduced to enhance the character of George, and to inspire an emulation of the most generous kind in the bosom of his predecessors. Learning, indeed, notwithstanding the eulogium which has been paid to some great names, has not found a sufficient encouragement hitherto in England, and it is rather surprising that every nation in Europe should have academies for promoting it but our own. Not to take up the reader's time, however, with reflections, which in the perusal of the following sheets must naturally occur to himself, it will be only necessary to observe further that the author, by making his hero conquer all France, and establishing him in the possession of that kingdom, seems to hint that our late treaty of peace was not altogether so advantageous as ministerial writers would have us think it, and that the moderation which we showed on that occasion was rather a little ill-timed. <laughs> 
Upon the whole it is presumed that the history of George the Sixth will merit the approbation of the candid, and that the reader of sense will himself comment upon passages that would not be so safe for our author to explain, and make proper allowances from the nature of the subject, for any seeming heaviness of style which accidentally arises in the narrative. End of the author's preface. Recording by Philip Gould. Introduction to the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction containing a review of British history, A.D. sixteen sixty to nineteen hundred. Although the period in our history of which these sheets contain an account is one of the most singular and remarkable, and more detached from the general arrangement of our annals than perhaps any other reign, yet it is necessary to sketch the outlines of the preceding times, that the reader may comprehend the whole picture at once in his imagination, without the pain of continued recollection. The splendor of the English nation ought to take its date from the civil wars in the seventeenth century which at the same time that they ruined individuals and threw the kingdom into a temporary state of confusion laid the foundation for that immense fabric which has since been erected it has been justly remarked that nations display their internal resources more and produce great men more abundantly after a civil war than at any other period the observation is drawn from history and needs no philosophical inquiries to establish it but most certainly the English nation made those prodigious acquisitions of trade within half a century after the death of Cromwell, that prepared the way for still greater increase. During the supine reigns of Charles the Second and James the Second, we were gaining on our neighbors. The revolution threw us into a new scene of action, and the wars we carried on, on the continent, at the same time that they secured the independency of Europe, opened new channels for our trade to flow in. But the most remarkable event of King William's reign was the beginning of a public debt, which has since been attended with such wonderful consequences. The reign of Queen Anne was a period in which the English arms made a respectable figure in Europe, during the continuance of the war, and her counsels like those of a succeeding reign a very pitiful one at the end. Footnote. An allusion, of course, to the great sacrifices made by Lord Bute at the Peace of Paris in February 1763 just before the publication of this pamphlet. In footnote, our trade still increased, and with it our public debt. The greatest part of the reigns of the first two Georges contained little remarkable. In reading their histories we meet with none of those actions that raise and elevate the soul, and make us wonder at the power that executed them. The period of our history that is graced with the name of George the Third is more splendid, it forms a remarkable era in the annals of Europe, not from the number of great geniuses that adorned his court, but from the multitude of virtues which constituted the character of the sovereign of a happy people. Yet even so great an assemblage of excellencies was not attended with a fortunate influence over the manners of his court. The great men of those days served but as a foil to set off the luster of royal virtues. Indeed, few endeavored to arrive at that summit of virtue which they considered impossible to attain, and therefore they prudently beheld the merit without any wish of imitation. In the reign of George the Fourth, eighteen ten to eighteen forty eight, were many remarkable events, but the most material occurrence which continued throughout that period was the amazing increase of the national debt. George the Fifth was a wise and virtuous prince, but the kingdom suffered from the want of capacity in his ministers and felt a very severe shock in the conquest of Holland. Footnote. By the French, in or about 1850. End footnote. He came to the crown in one of the most critical moments that it is possible one prince can succeed another. His kingdom was in the greatest confusion occasioned by a long and unfortunate war with Russia. In vain had his predecessors endeavored at an immense expense to prevent the fatal aggrandizement of that empire. In vain had the Parliament granted every necessary supply to prevent the northern kingdoms from being swallowed into one prodigious monarchy. Every effort which the Fifth Grand Alliance Europe had seen could make was ineffectual. Sweden and Denmark, notwithstanding their being so powerfully assisted, were unable to defend themselves. Everything submitted to the rapidity of Peter's arms and the first maritime power in the world, 
who had so long possessed the dominion of the sea, saw its fleets beaten, and its coasts insulted. The ministry was unsettled, and the violent agitation of the whole kingdom, owing to the sad state of the public funds, conspired to form one of those critical situations which require great judgment and abilities in the prince, and a unanimous concurrence of his parliament to guide the helm with success. The king, in part, effected it, but during his long reign the nation was far from being in a flourishing situation, and the dismal prospect of national bankruptcy, which the most penetrating politicians clearly foresaw must soon come to pass, cast a general damp on the spirits of the people. In the end of the nineteenth century a certain languor in the administration foretold some terrible crisis was at hand. In the midst of this general despondency the king died, and was succeeded by George the Sixth, the history of whose reign is the subject of the following sheets, a period the most remarkable and abounding in the most astonishing events that have ever been recorded in modern history. End of the Introduction Recording by Philip Gould Chapter One of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen forty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three by Samuel Madden. Chapter One, A. D. nineteen hundred. First Acts of this Prince's Reign. Ministerial Changes, National Debt, State of Europe. The very first acts of this prince's reign were such as caught the attention of all Europe. Footnote. He ascended the throne the 16th of February, 1900. In footnote. They indicated not only a soaring genius, but a judgment far beyond his years. The nation had formed the most ardent hopes of their young sovereign, in his education and very youth he had given signs of what was one day to be expected of him, and all ranks of people turned their weary eyes on him as their pilot through that sea of troubles which it was too evident was rising to overwhelm them. The king in all his actions showed himself worthy of their confidence. His father's ministry was composed of a set of men who, though they did not want abilities, were not such as he chose to employ but his inclinations in this point could not be fully indulged from several circumstances. The Duke of Bedford, Lord High Treasurer, had such prodigious interest in the Parliament, owing more to his immense riches than his personal merit, that his removal would have been dangerous, so he continued him in his post till a more favourable opportunity should offer itself. The Duke of Northumberland was removed from being President of the Council, and was succeeded by the Earl of Surrey. The Duke of Marlborough was made Secretary of State for the Southern Department, and the Marquis of Kildare for the Northern, Lord Sands and Mr. Stevens retiring with pensions. Footnote. In the eighteenth century the two Secretaries of State bore these names, and were supposed to divide the cognizance of foreign affairs between them. The Northern Secretary, in addition to superintending the affairs of Northern Europe, was also supposed to keep an eye on Ireland. This clumsy arrangement was abolished in 1782, when home and foreign secretaries were created. In footnote. The Duke of Suffolk, Lord Privy Seal, in the room of the Duke of St. Albans, and the Duke of Grafton, First Lord of the Admiralty, which then happened to be vacant by the death of the Duke of Atoll. These were the principal alterations which were made in the great offices of state. Footnote. These changes took place in February and the beginning of March, 1900, in footnote. But the above personages were not possessed of equal authority, or entrusted with the same confidence by the king. It was at first foreseen that the principal share of power would rest in the Duke of Suffolk, who possessed his majesty's ear more than any of his other servants, and was designed to succeed the Duke of Bedford as soon as he could be removed with safety. This young nobleman was of a disposition congenial with his sovereigns. He had improved his mind by reading the most celebrated authors, and possessed that penetrating genius which easily comprehends and fully attains the objects of its study. He had travelled through the principal courts of Europe, and understood their different interests and connections with abundance of ease and perspicuity. 
he possessed the confidence and friendship of the king who loved him but his promotion gave offence to many and caused great envy as he was originally of a mean family and besides was sometimes apt to behave rather haughtily to his superiors footnote this dukedom of suffolk must therefore be supposed to be a new creation of the reign of george v and not connected with the earldom of the same name held by the howards in the eighteenth century in writing of a duke of suffolk of mean family our author may have been remembering michael de la pole in footnote the ceremony of the late king's burial was no sooner over and the ministry settled for the present than writs were issued for the meeting of a new parliament which assembled with the highest opinion of their new sovereign deeply impressed on their minds and a unanimity of design to be expeditious in every public business that should come under their consideration footnote thirteenth of april nineteen hundred in footnote it would be tedious to the reader and is below the dignity of history to enter minutely into the debates of the two houses and to describe the numberless little circumstances that attend the inferior motions of the legislature these matters are proper for the annals of the times but it is our business to exhibit only those outlines and stronger strokes of colouring that characterize the manners of the age and give the boldest ideas of the history of the period the first affair of consequence that came before them was the civil list there was a debt contracted on it of above five hundred thousand pounds this was paid off and with a liberality boundless and perhaps in its consequences dangerous they augmented that branch of the grants by half a million yearly so that the civil list was now two millions a year a prodigious sum increased by degrees for nearly four centuries but what made this act of generosity imprudent to the highest degree was their settling it for life it is true their opinion of their new sovereign was not groundless but dangerous precedents ought never to be established nothing was of greater importance than their debates on the public debt the amount of it was astonishing although the fatal year thirty four footnote eighteen thirty four in footnote had sponged eighty millions of it it was now above two hundred and ten millions the interest of this enormous sum alone amounted to eight millions five hundred thousand pounds and as the principal was every year increasing to pay off the interest it was evident that it must very soon come to a sponge footnote the actual amount of the national debt in eighteen ninety nine is six hundred thirty eight million two hundred thousand pounds and the interest on it with the cost of management added is about twenty five million pounds in footnote to prevent the dreadful consequences such an event must be attended with the parliament laid a tax of ten per cent on stock for one year but this was only a temporary expedient and ruined numbers whose property in the public funds was fluctuating they voted five hundred thousand pounds to be expended in repairing the navy and building new ships a service most necessary and advantageous for the russian fleet threatened that of britain with utter destruction in case of a new war this it was feared was not far off for the truce which had been signed was almost expired without having as yet produced its desired effect a lasting peace the grants on the whole amounted to fourteen millions footnote the actual sum voted for eighteen ninety nine is one hundred twelve million nine hundred thousand pounds just eight times the amount of our author's estimate in footnote a sum which would have astonished all the world had we not been in possession of such a flourishing commerce but it was a time of peace and had we been engaged in an expensive war we could have added very little to our income but it will be necessary to present the reader with a view of the state of europe at the time this monarch came to the crown the nations that formed what we call the north having been overturned by the immense power of the russians made one vast monarchy which comprehended muscovy sweden norway denmark and lithuania now called the empire of russia peter the fourth was the monarch that swayed the imperial sceptre a prince whose martial feats were hardly ever exceeded if we consider his barbarous courage and successful temerity the acquisitions he had made were the effects of mere personal courage in himself 
that excited an ardor in his troops, and not the consequence of policy or design. He was an indifferent statesman, and a savage man. No sooner were his own and his predecessors' arms successful in the attacks which they made on their neighbors, than he turned all his efforts on raising a maritime power superior to that of Britain. For above eleven years all the ports of the Baltic were filled with preparations, and in the year 1897 Peter saw himself in possession of a naval force of two hundred men of war of the line, besides an innumerable number of frigates and smaller vessels. The greater part of this prodigious fleet was manned. The amazing trade of his extensive dominions produced him seamen in abundance. In a word, he was superior to England by sea, and the British coasts were open to his invasions, when a truce was patched up between the two nations. The marriage which had transferred the dominions of the House of Austria to that of Prussia, and with them the imperial title, seemed to have extinguished that generous bravery and political reputation which the kings of Prussia had enjoyed for so many centuries. The Emperor Frederick the Ninth was in every respect a weak prince. He was governed by his queen, and she by the intriguing Count Buckberg, Prime Minister, a man of abilities, but who was suspected of holding a correspondence with his master's enemies. Footnote. Presumably a member of the princely house of Leip Buckberg, Leip Schomburg, still existing. In footnote. The last Prince of Baden had gained great reputation in the last war with France, and by his victories had enabled Frederick to conclude an advantageous peace with that kingdom. But being Buckberg's enemy had lately been disgraced and was entered into the English service, the late king receiving him with many marks of satisfaction. Charles X sat this time on the throne of France. He had the reputation of being a most cunning and politic prince, was brave, and had had some success at the head of his army against the imperialists. He had just entered into a close alliance with Russia. Had the phantom of a balance of power been the foible of these days, such an alliance would have alarmed all Europe. But it had no other effect than making the King of Britain very jealous of his neighbor. Spain was in profound peace, excepting a temporary disturbance which arose from a third rebellion of the Portuguese, but was quelled with very little trouble and the conquered nation saw not the least hopes of regaining their independence. Footnote. We are unfortunately not given any date for this conquest of Portugal by Spain, somewhere in the early nineteenth century. End footnote. The peace of Italy was almost at an end. The preparations that were making by the two kings of Venice and Sicily prognosticated the renewal of their quarrel. The patrimony of St. Peter, which had so long been wrested from the church, was again likely to be the scene of devastation. It was supposed that Venice would have the assistance of France, who has always found her account in intermeddling with the affairs of Italy. Footnote. The kingdom of Venice must have been very small compared with that of the two Sicilies, as we find on page 64 that Milan was in the hands of the latter. Presumably the kingdom of Venice only comprised the dominions of the old Venetian Republic. End footnote. Such was the situation of affairs in Europe at the time George the Sixth came to the crown. End of chapter one. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter two of the reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, nineteen hundred to nineteen o one, war with Russia, naval defeat off the Dutch coast, intrepidity of the king, transactions in Parliament, invasion, battle of Weatherby, naval engagement. As there were but a few months of the truce with Russia unexpired, the king hastened the preparations for war with redoubled vigor. He had many obstacles to overcome, but the greatest was the want of money. The national debt was a bottomless gulf that swallowed up everything. The navy was much behindhand in arrears, and many little mutinies had been raised by the sailors for the want of their pay. But at last, after a thousand difficulties, a formidable fleet was fitted out at the ports of Harwich, Hull, and Edinburgh. 
It consisted of fifty-five sail of the line and two and twenty frigates. The Russians were later in their preparations, so that when the truce was expired, which was the 8th of September, their fleet was not ready to sail. The command of the British squadron was given to the Duke of Grafton, the first Lord of the Admiralty. Admiral Phillips and Sir Charles Montague commanded the rear and van divisions under him. It is impossible to express the consternation of all ranks of people on the sailing of this fleet. The fate of the war depended not only on its success in the action, but on its being able to keep the enemy within the sound. Thirty thousand Russians were embarked on board their squadron, which consisted of seventy sail of the line, besides frigates and a large fleet of transports, as they designed to attempt an invasion. Their land forces were commanded by the Marshal Schmetau, and the fleet by the Prince of Philograf. Their superiority was formidable, not only in number of ships, but they were in general larger than the English, and their sailors had former successes imprinted on their minds. The Duke of Grafton, having collected the British squadron, set sail with a fair wind for the Baltic, but the third day he was blown by a storm on the coast of Holland. Unfortunately the enemy's fleet was out of the sound before the wind changed, and the same storm brought them in sight of the British fleet. It blew very hard when the engagement began, which was about four in the afternoon, with great fury. Footnote. November 3rd, 1900. In footnote. The Duke and the Prince both exerted themselves with great vigour and fought with the most heroic bravery. The Royal George of one hundred guns, the English Admiral's ship, was disabled by three Russian men of war, each of eighty guns. About six the Duke shifted his flag to the Blenheim, and in half an hour after the Royal George sunk. The Russian Admiral shifted his flag three times before the morning, for the battle lasted all night with the utmost fury. Sir Charles Montague was killed in the beginning of the engagement, and at last the Duke himself was wounded and carried under deck. Phillips continued the action with the greatest bravery and conduct, and had it pleased God that the wind had been less violent, he would in all probability have been the conqueror. But the storm increasing, the two fleets were obliged to separate. The Russians' loss was very considerable. Their vice-admiral was killed, they had three ships taken, one sunk and two blown up, with about seven thousand men killed and wounded. The loss of the English was much less in number, but they had several ships quite disabled. The day after this fatal engagement the British fleet kept in sight of the Russians, but without having it in their power to attack them, they were too much weakened by their loss, and the enemy making some motions which indicated a design to renew the engagement, Phillips thought it most for the king's service to retire into port and refit. The king was at council when the news of the action was brought him. He was undismayed and replied, The Lord's will be done. But it was a clap of thunder to every mortal besides. It was every moment expected that the Russian general would make a descent. The whole nation was in the utmost confusion. A sudden run upon the bank was near occasioning a stop and the stocks, which bore four per cent, fell down to thirty-five. In this critical moment all eyes were turned on the king, as the only pilot in so terrible a storm. It was impossible to be guided by a better, and had not Britain possessed a sovereign of such singular intrepidity and prudence, she would have seen her last days. His Majesty, when he found the turn affairs were likely to take, prudently ventured to send an order to the bank to stop payment till the kingdom was more secure, and, at the same time, issued out a proclamation assuring his subjects that this was but a temporary measure till the affairs of the nation would permit of more regularity. He immediately assembled the Parliament by proclamation and went himself to the Admiralty, where he sat three hours dictating orders. Dispatches were sent to every port in England to hasten the equipment of a new fleet. Troops were marching from all parts to the capital. In short, this young monarch was, at this critical moment, the very life and soul of the state. He managed everything himself, and almost without assistance, for his ministry and the council were so divided in their opinions and debates that he put very little faith in any of them. In the midst of this scene of confusion advice was brought that the Russians, to the amount of twenty-five thousand men, had landed on the coast of Durham, 
and their fleet soon after disappeared, it was supposed, in order to convey a second embarkation. The affairs of Britain were now arrived at a most dangerous crisis, more terrible in appearance than any she had ever seen, and many circumstances combined to render her state really dreadful. The army was weak and ill-paid, the formidable naval power of the Russians having obliged the administration to turn all their efforts toward the fleet. The general despondence which prevailed throughout the nation upon account of the dead increased the shades of this sad picture. The riches of individuals were now found to be of but little avail to the good of the state, and while we enjoyed a more extensive trade than ever, the nation was upon the brink of ruin. The Russians threw all their force into their royal navy, so that our commerce had suffered very little from privateers. The Parliament being assembled in the greatest haste and confusion, the King went to the House, and in a sensible and nervous speech laid before them the dangerous situation of the nation, and painted to them in the strongest colors the absolute necessity for vigorous measures to preserve them from their impending ruin. He informed them the enemy was landed, and on the march to York, that the only defense they had now to trust was to the army, which was itself weak and discontented for want of pay, that the late misfortune at sea must be speedily repaired, in short, that the urgency of the times required every moment to be made use of. He told them that money was wanted for a variety of uses, and that instantly, that the time was too short to raise it, and their credit too weak to borrow it. That as circumstances were thus situated, he saw no expedient but their enabling him to make use of the money in the hands of the bank trustees, which was designed for the immediate interest of the public debt for more public and immediate necessities. George made little doubt but that the Parliament would readily come into any measures at so critical a juncture for the good of their country. But in this he was fatally mistaken. Peter had conveyed immense sums into England, and had most politically distributed them to the most advantageous purposes. He had secured a large party, and this with the influence of the Duke of Bedford. For that nobleman was against the court in every debate, owing to his being debarred of that share of power usually given to a Lord High Treasurer, obstructed every measure proposed for coming to some speedy resolutions. At last, after the greatest heats and the warmest debates ever known, it was determined to reject the King's proposal, and address him to remove from his counsels and service the Duke of Suffolk, who they apprehended was the adviser of those measures. The king's indignation at receiving this address is not to be expressed. He had expected the most hearty concurrence in every national measure he could have proposed. But when he found out how much he was mistaken, he broke out into a violent exclamation against his enemies in the Parliament, and flew into a violent passion to the House. He turned the speaker out of the chair, and, seating himself in it, I flattered myself, said he, that a British Parliament would have acted on British principles. But to your great dishonour I find myself mistaken. A powerful enemy is landed and on the march. That time which you would waste in senseless disputes is too precious for me to follow so pernicious an example. I shall place myself at the head of my troops, and act for the honour and good of my country. But let those traitors that dare form machinations against the public peace dread the indignation of an injured and enraged sovereign. He had no sooner thundered out these words than he left the house with very visible marks of anger. As none knew the king's intentions, all were terrified. Those who had so violently opposed his former proposal, dreading his discovering their guilt, and were dismayed. They now offered to address his majesty to take the state under his protection. This resolution was quickly agreed to, but before it could be concluded, the house was alarmed with a violent mob who had broken into the antechambers, and threatened destruction to every man who should oppose the king's will. Terror now sat in every countenance. Nothing less than immediate ruin was the object of every one's fears. Without much altercation, however, they hastily drew up an act by which the king was enabled to apply all the money in the hands of the bank trustees to public service, in such manner as he thought most expedient. Footnote. First of December, 1900. End footnote. This was a dreadful stroke to the public credit. Stocks sunk almost to nothing, and the consequences were an immediate stop in the payment of the public interest. 
However, in violent disorders, violent remedies are necessary. The king no sooner possessed this money, which amounted to some millions, than he paid off all the arrears of the army, and gave orders for the same in the navy. Nothing could exceed the rapidity of his measures. His troops were rendezvoused at Buckingham, and in a few days he put himself at the head of them. The whole army, when collected, amounted to near thirty thousand men, five thousand of which were horse. In the meantime, the enemy under Count Schmittau had made little or no progress, considering the time they had been landed. Had they marched immediately for London the moment they were debarked, George would have had much less time to collect his forces. But Schmittau having taken Durham by storm, he most imprudently gave his troops three days to plunder. This conduct was madness itself. The Russians broke into all the houses and were guilty of every species of excess. Their cruelties were unheard of and unparalleled. The most tender age was no defense against these merciless monsters. Old men, women, and children were butchered in cold blood in the most shocking manner. It would make humanity recoil to relate their horrid barbarities. But their soldiers were soon intoxicated with liquor and cruelty, and all discipline and order were at an end. The king, being informed of the condition of the enemy, hastened his marches with all the expedition that was possible. He reached Lincoln in five days, and there understood that Schmittau, on the advance of his approach, had drawn out his men from Durham, though not without great difficulty, and was on the march to York. His majesty pushed on to meet him before he could reach that city, but as it was too strong to be taken by surprise, Schmittau encamped between York and Weatherby, footnote, some eight miles due west of York, in footnote, and prepared to fight the king who was within five miles of him. There were several circumstances that induced George to determine on hazarding an action immediately. He expected soon to hear of another army of Russians landing, and he thought that avoiding a battle would damp the spirits of his soldiers. Add to this the barbarous ravages of the savage enemy called aloud on his humanity to put a stop to the miseries of his suffering subjects. He accordingly drew near to the enemy and reconnoitred their situation, and prepared to attack them the next day, the 23rd of December. Schmittau drew up his army on the side of a hill, with a rivulet in his front, a wood on each wing, and a village in his rear, which he had slightly fortified, and threw some battalions into the houses. All the king's motions seemed to indicate a design of attacking him in his front, and he had therefore raised several batteries that commanded the passage of the rivulet. His Majesty, however, finding that all the attention of the enemy was carried to their front, determined to make only a feint there, and attack them in their rear. Accordingly, about three o'clock in the morning, he gave General Summers the command of ten thousand men, with orders to remain in the field ready for action at a moment's warning, and as soon as he heard a signal they agreed on, to pass the rivulet and make an attack on the enemy's front, while the king himself would pass the river higher up, and fall on their rear. This scheme had all the success that could have been wished for. General Summers had no sooner made his attack than Schmittau gave in to the snare. He concluded immediately that the whole English army was at his front, and placing himself at the head of his first line, which included the choice of his army, he repulsed the English, but by the unparalleled bravery of the British troops was obliged to give way himself in his turn. Just at that critical moment the king made his attack on his rear with a fury that at once threw the Russians into confusion, and Schmittau, finding himself between two fires, would have made his retreat had it been in his power. He made every effort to recover his oversight, and thrice rallied and led his troops to the charge, but the unconquerable fury of the king's attacks overcame everything. Never man performed greater feats of personal valor. He had three horses killed under him, and as he was going to mount a fourth was near being shot by a Russian grenadier, but his carbine missing fire the king shot him dead. What concluded the day was Schmittau's being killed by a cannonball. His death dispirited his men, and they soon gave way. The situation of the ground would permit but a few to escape, and those in small bodies through the woods. About twelve o'clock the battle was over. Ten thousand Russians were killed and wounded, and seven thousand made prisoners. The loss of the English was not inconsiderable. It amounted to about three thousand killed and wounded. The Dukes of Rutland and Newcastle, the Earl of Winchelsea, and Generals Howard, Chales, 
Lord, and French were killed, besides which many officers of distinction were wounded. This victory raised the spirits of the people, and it was particularly pleasing to them as their young and next to adored monarch gained it. The shouts of the army were equal to the applauses of the people, and where a prince had given such uncommon instances of prudence as well as bravery, it was impossible but that he should be universally beloved. The king had discovered a disposition which no dangers could intimidate nor difficulties depress. He had no sooner fought the Russian army than he was informed a fresh fleet, more powerful than their former, was on the coast of Suffolk. This news, which cast a fresh alarm on the minds of the people, only quickened the rapidity of the king's motions. The English fleet was collected in the Thames and Medway, and by means of the greatest expedition was ready to sail, but waited for a fair wind. It consisted of sixty-four sail of the line and thirty-two frigates. George was no sooner informed of the enemy than he determined to command his fleet himself. He rode with all expedition to Chatham, and took the command from the Duke of Grafton, who was recovered of his late wounds, but his grace continued in the ship with his majesty to give him his advice. The Britannia on board of which was the king was without exception the finest ship in the world. She carried 120 brass guns, and in the opinion of the best judges, was so well built and manned that no single ship could live near her. Nothing could exceed the joy of the sailors at having their young victorious sovereign at their head. They expressed the greatest impatience to attack the enemy, and the wind, fortunately shifting, in two days gave them their desire. The Russian fleet consisted of eighty-nine sail of the line besides frigates and a fleet of transports which it was supposed might contain about ten thousand soldiers. About eight in the morning, footnote, January 10th, 1901, in footnote, the battle begun. The enemy's admiral, Steinhold, in a ship of eighty guns, and another of seventy, bore down on the Britannia. The king met them and singly engaged them. At one broadside the Russian admiral was sunk to the bottom a dreadful stroke which threw their fleet into disorder. The other seventy-gun ship sheered off in a few minutes, and the Britannia was left without an enemy. The Marlborough was engaged with two Russian ships, who were too strong for her. But the king, pouring a broadside into one of them, immediately turned the superiority in favor of the Marlborough. By eleven o'clock the Russian fleet sheered off, and His Majesty chased. Nine of their line of battleships were taken, three sunk, and two burnt. Forty transports were also taken and several sunk. Thus did this young and gallant monarch, with all the courage, conduct, and skill of an experienced admiral, defeat the enemy's fleet, which was so much superior to his own. This second victory raised the fame of the king to the highest pitch, changed the face of affairs, and spread a general joy through the breasts of all his subjects. End of chapter 2 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Three of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, A.D. nineteen o one to nineteen o two. Military and naval preparations of the king, war with France, invasion of Flanders, battle of Winnex, rapid successes. The Russians defeated at sea. Peace of Beauvais. Two such glorious victories seated George with security on the throne, but his success did not occasion the least neglect in his military preparations. He was now superior to the enemy at sea, and was determined at all events to preserve his superiority. Ten sail were fitted out with all expedition at Milford Haven, and other squadrons were getting ready at Portsmouth, Plymouth, Chatham, Hall, and Lynn. The king had particular reasons for not suffering his preparations to relax. The king of France was at this time busy in fitting out a large fleet, and all the ports of that kingdom, from Amsterdam to Bayonne, resounded with naval armaments. George looked on them with a very jealous eye. The court of Versailles indeed gave out that they were intended against the emperor of Morocco, who had lately insulted a French ambassador but it was evident that preparations so very great indicated some further design in view. However, a trifling accident soon explained the views of the French king. 
An English privateer in the channel having attacked another carrying Russian colors and disabled her, she hung out French colors. It seems a merchant at Rotterdam had fitted her out to cruise upon the English, and gave the captain orders if he met with an enemy too strong for him, to show French colors. This affair, in which the French were evidently aggressors, was made a pretense for a quarrel. The French ambassador at London demanded satisfaction for the damage done the French ship, the king returned a most spirited answer, and in short, after many memorials and replies, the king of France declared war against Great Britain, and was answered by his Britannic Majesty. Footnote. May 6th, 1901. End footnote. Charles, jealous of the British power, had entered into an offensive and defensive treaty with Peter, and had agreed to receive the Russian ships into the ports of France, and by combining their respective fleets to overpower the naval force of George at once. Fortunately for the king, Peter was dilatory in his preparations. The British fleet, to the amount of ninety sail of the line, was ready for action, and saw no enemy that could look it in the face. But the king was determined to lose no time. Collecting a large fleet of transports, he embarked twenty thousand men on board them, and resolved to form an invasion of France. He gave out that he designed to attack Brest and to deceive the enemy the better sent vessels to sound the depth of water on several parts of the coasts of Brittany. The enemy marched down troops from all parts of France to defend themselves where they thought the descent was intended, but the king's plan was well laid and unsuspected by the court of Versailles. Instead of steering to the coast of Brittany, he directed his course to that of Flanders, and without the least opposition landed his whole army on the beach of Blankenburg. He immediately published and dispersed a memorial to the Dutch, exhorting them to take this favorable opportunity of regaining their liberty, promising to do everything for them that could be in any way conducive to so salutary an end. But their spirits were too much depressed, and they were kept too much in awe by the garrisons that were in their several fortresses, to listen to a deliverer. George marched towards Bruges, which capitulated without the firing of a gun. Ostend, Ypres, and Newport cost him some days, but his progress was so rapid before the French had an army to oppose him, that his difficulty in these conquests was not very great. The Marshal Duke de Vivion at last appeared near Dunkirk after a forced march at the head of forty thousand men. The king was no sooner informed of his approach than he determined to fight him directly. Delays to him were dangerous, whereas the enemy would every day increase in strength. Vivion was encamped at Winnox, and entrenching himself waited for reinforcements. But George, having sent spies to reconnoitre his situation, found that his piquets were placed in a very negligent manner, and that it would be no difficult circumstance to surprise him in the night. In pursuance of this opinion, about one in the morning of the 10th of September, at the head of ten regiments forming the first line of his army, he attacked the enemy's entrenchments. The onset was no sooner made than they were forced. The French soldiers ran naked to their arms. Several of their generals did all in their power to rally them, but in vain. The Duc de Vivion had his head shot off by a cannonball in the beginning of the attack, and before daylight their army was defeated and totally dispersed. The enemy being pursued in great numbers made prisoners, the king presented himself before Dunkirk, and the cowardly governor gave up the town to his astonishment without attempting anything for its defence. Calais opened its gates to the conqueror, and St. Omer surrendered after a week's siege. These rapid successes terrified the court of Charles. They were surprised at the boldness of George's attempt to make a regular attack on so powerful a monarchy as that of France with such a handful of men. But it was a maxim with the king to despise numerous armies. Forty thousand men, he often said under a good general, were a match for any number and with some favourable circumstances even twenty-five or thirty thousand. Charles, to stop the progress of his Britannic Majesty, placed the Duke of Ventadour at the head of a prodigious army collected from all parts of France of near one hundred thousand men, a force if well managed being divided into two or three armies, strong enough to overwhelm George at once. But numerous as this body of troops were, they came only to be spectators of the success of the King of England. Without a single blow his majesty made himself master of Boulogne, and slipping by the French army in the night surprised Montreuil, 
the road to Paris was now open to him. The royal family retired from Versailles. Charles would have tried the fortune of the war himself, but a violent fit of the gout confined him to his palace. The Duke de Ventadour, by his injudicious motions, was incapable of stopping the King's progress. He laid siege to Amiens, and it surrendered before the Duke could arrive to protect it. Neufchatel had the same fate, and the King, astonished at his own success, had thoughts of making a flying march to Paris. The French army formed such an unwieldy body that it was forever exposed to the sudden attacks of the English. Ventador was but an indifferent general, and had to oppose a young monarch whose late actions rendered him the most celebrated commander in Europe. In the meantime the attention of Peter was called off in a great measure from the English war by a new enemy that had made a formidable attack upon his dominions. Bajazet, Emperor of the Turks, an old enemy of the Tsars, thought this a fair opportunity to recover Krim Tartary, which the Russian monarch had conquered from him in the last war. Footnote. This is not a very happy forecast. The Crimea was conquered by Russia as early as 1783, instead of in the end of the 19th century. In footnote. In this situation he listened with pleasure to the remonstrances of the English ambassador who left no stone unturned that could engage the emperor in the war. Bajazet thought the moment so fair when Peter was engaged in a most expensive war with Great Britain that the Grand Vizier, Selim, at the head of two hundred thousand men marched into Russia. The Tsar collected his forces to oppose this inundation of Turks and just as the two armies were beginning the war, the Russian fleet of near one hundred sail of the line appeared in the channel. The British fleet under the Duke of Grafton, who, though he had sometimes met with ill success, was one of the greatest admirals Britain had ever produced, was about equal in force to that of the Russians. It was not long before the two admirals found an opportunity to engage. It would be tedious to give the particulars of this furious battle. It lasted a whole day without being decisive. The Russians lost five ships of the line and the English four. If anything, the advantage was for the latter. But before morning the two fleets parted, and, the wind blowing a violent storm for the two next days, nineteen Russian men-of-war were driven ashore on the coast of Norfolk, and were there burnt. The English lost only two, but had several dismasted. This stroke secured to George his superiority at sea. This navy was so powerful that the French fleets were blocked up in their ports and were not strong enough to look the English in the face, so that Charles now saw all his hopes blasted, and the King of England at the head of a victorious army ready to march to Paris itself. In this critical situation he determined to sue for peace. George, whose conduct was guided by justice, not by inordinate ambition, readily listened to the proposal. He appointed ambassadors to meet those of France at Beauvais, where a peace was soon agreed to. The Tsar sent an ambassador on his part, so it became general between the three nations. The principal article was that Charles should cause to be paid to the King of Great Britain two millions of pounds sterling for the expenses of the war, at three equal payments, six months between each. The treaty being signed by the two monarchs and the Russian ambassador, footnote, 11th January, 1902, in footnote, George withdrew his forces out of France and evacuated all his conquests. End of chapter 3. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 4 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. 1902 to 1916. Interest of the national debt reduced. The building of the palace and city of Stanley. The Royal Academies. George the Sixth encourages the arts, sciences, and literature. Never was any quarrel concluded more gloriously. George now found himself at peace with all the world. He had been victorious against the most potent monarchy on earth and another formidable kingdom. These successes secured him abroad, but at home all was confusion. The stopping payment of the interest of the public debt had thrown innumerable families into extreme indigence, yet the measure was absolutely necessary, and the very existence of the nation had been preserved by it. But as the war was now at an end, 
the Parliament took under their consideration the state of the national debt, and after a multitude of proposals, calculations, and debates, they agreed by a small majority that the interest at the rate it then stood was a burden too great for the nation to bear, and appointed a committee to draw up a bill for reducing it. The preamble to this bill set forth the sad internal state of the nation, painted in the strongest colors, the impossibility of paying the interest on the national funds, showed that an attempt to go on in doing it must end in a total bankruptcy and the utter ruin of all concerned, that under these circumstances half the present interest would be of more real value than the whole, in the dangerous situation they were now in, and the bill accordingly enacted that the interest on every fund of which the national fund was composed should be reduced by one half. Footnote that is, from four to two per cent. That the former rate prevailed in 1900 is shown by the figures on page 8, giving £8,500,000 as the interest on £211,000,000 or thereabouts. As the interest for 1903 was, after the change, just £4,250,000, we must conclude that the King had somehow contrived to fight through the war of 1900 to 1902, without any further borrowing. End footnote. History cannot produce an instance of such an event as this being effected with so little disturbance. All ranks of people seemed content with their half. They had lately seen the extreme danger to which the nation was reduced for want of money, and they cheerfully considered that, if they lost half of their income, it was to preserve their lives, their liberties, and the remainder of their fortunes. This great event would not have been brought about with so much ease and expedition, but the path was sketched out by the bill which was drawn up for the same, but which miscarried in the reign of George the Fourth. But it no sooner passed into a law now than its good consequences were immediately felt by the nation in general. Such an enormous encumbrance was no sooner removed than George found his kingdom vigorous and more formidable than ever. It may not be unentertaining to the reader here to lay before him the particulars of the grants of the year 1903 after the peace had taken place. Fifty thousand seamen, including marines and ordnance for sea service, two million nine hundred thousand pounds. Forty-five thousand men, land forces in colonies in Great Britain, etc., and ordnance for ditto, two million two hundred fifty thousand pounds. Greenwich Hospital, thirty five thousand pounds milford hospital forty thousand pounds building rebuilding and repairing his majesty's ships six hundred thousand pounds to the nine foundling hospitals ninety thousand pounds adding new fortifications to batavia etc one hundred thousand pounds to his majesty for fortifying other places in the east indies fifty thousand pounds deepening and enlarging the harbour of Hull and docks, two hundred thousand pounds. Civil list, two million pounds. Total, eight million two hundred thirty-five thousand pounds. Interest of the national debt, four million two hundred fifty thousand pounds. Total, twelve million four hundred eighty-five thousand pounds. Footnote. Putting the actual estimates for 1898 to 1899 beside these figures, we find them eight times as great. An army of 250,000 regulars, excluding India, militia, and volunteers, costs us 20 million pounds. A navy of 93,000 men requires 25 million pounds. The civil service estimates to run about 22 million pounds. End footnote. A young monarch of his active spirit was not likely to waste the time which peace left on his hands in idle dissipation. He understood many arts perfectly, and was tolerably well acquainted with most. His favorite, the Duke of Suffolk, was also a lover of literature, and spent a great part of his time in the conversation of men of letters. The arts and sciences at this period in England wanted nothing but encouragement to raise them to a very splendid height and to make the age of George the Sixth rival any of those remote ones that are so celebrated in history. It is both entertaining and curious to reflect on their state during this reign, and compare it with the present. Those great men whose names alone would have immortalized the age of George the Sixth are now gone, and have left none to succeed them. 
Indeed, they still live in their admirable works, but have left few successors to their genius and abilities. But to leave this digression, let us take a view of the arts in the period of which we are speaking. George had a natural taste for them, and what was of equal consequence to their success was rich, liberal, and magnificent. Hitherto, his time had been engrossed by more weighty concerns, but now that peace left him the master of his time, he displayed a taste and genius in more arts than that of war. London, though the wonder of the world, never pleased the king. Its prodigious size was its only boast. It contained few buildings that did honor to the nation. In a word, it was a city finely calculated for trade, but not for the residence of the polite arts. The meanness of His Majesty's palace disgusted him. He had a taste for architecture and determined to exert it in raising an edifice that should at once do honor to his kingdom and add splendor to his court. In Rutlandshire, near Uppingham, was a small hunting box of the late king, which George admired, not for the building, but for its beautiful situation. In his hours of rural amusement the king formed the design of raising a palace. Few parts of his dominions could afford a more desirable spot for such a purpose. The old seat stood on an elevated situation, which commanded an extensive prospect over the adjacent country. It was almost surrounded with extensive woods, which having been artfully planted added the greatest beauty to the prospect without intercepting the view. On one side there was an easy descent of about three miles which led into an extensive plain through which a river took its meandering course. Many villages seemed to rise here and there from out the woods which gave a great variety to the scene, and the fertile plain was one continued prospect of villages, groves, meadows, and rivulets, and all was in the neighborhood of a noble and capacious forest. Footnote. There is no place of the name of Stanley near Eppingham. The situation described is that of Stoke Dry or Glaston. The river is the Welland, and the distant forest that of Rockingham. In footnote. This charming situation must have struck any person of less taste than the king. He was charmed with it at the first sight, and soon after thought of building a palace on so advantageous a situation. The famous Gilbert, whose name is immortalized by so many works of genius, was at that time architect to the king. He drew the plans of several palaces, out of which his majesty chose one, and immediately set him about the work. Many difficulties were to be overcome before even the first stone could be laid. The fabric was to be built with Portland stone, which could not be brought to the spot without an infinite expense over land. To remedy this inconvenience, the Parliament passed an act to make the river well and navigable to the very plain, at the bottom of the hill on which the intended palace was to be raised. The same session also granted His Majesty a million sterling towards the expense of building this magnificent pile. The King spared no cost to render this edifice the most magnificent and superb palace in the universe. Gilbert had an unlimited power granted him to follow his genius in every particular without the least restraint. Fleets of ships were continually passing from Portland to Hull and Lynn with cargoes of stone, which were conveyed in barges to the place where the palace was to be built. Ten sail were sent to the different ports of Italy to load the finest marbles. In short, nothing was spared to make this palace the wonder of the world, but the erection of it was only a part of the king's design. Footnote. It was founded in 1907. In footnote. In the plain above described, His Majesty formed the scheme of raising a city, but was staggered at the thoughts of the expense. However, more the architect hinted to him that if His Majesty was to raise a few public edifices, and remove some of the courts from London thither, they would alone occasion numbers to build near their residence, that His Majesty's fixing his own residence there would also occasion a vast increase of building. The King was pleased with the thought and determined to execute it. The great Gilbert drew the ground plot of that part which now reaches from St. Mary's Church quite to Great Hollis Street and Scotland Square. St. Stephen's was his work, too, and is a beautiful monument of his taste and genius. That church and the Academy for Architecture, footnote, both erected in 1909, in footnote, were the two first public buildings that were raised. Moore was the artist who erected the latter, 
but this deserves a more particular mention. Architecture was one of the king's favorite studies, but its being an art was recommendation enough for that great monarch to encourage it. The plan on which this academy was formed was finally imagined to secure a perpetual protection. It consisted of a president with a salary of two thousand pounds a year. Gilbert was the first. Six senior footnote. The first instituted were Comans, Holt, Moore, Brown, Salviola, the Spaniard, and Stevens. In footnote. And twelve junior footnote. James, Philipson, Pedreo, an Italian, Rickson, Manley, Hare, Thompson, Johnson, Wheel, Place, Richards, and Stevenson, end footnote. Professors had the former five, and the latter three hundred pounds a year each. What a noble institution was this, worthy the monarch who formed the outline and the minister that finished the design, footnote, the Duke of Suffolk, end footnote. George had the satisfaction of seeing Stanley increased beyond what his most ardent wishes could have desired. Most of the nobility and many of the rich commoners, in imitation of their sovereign, erected magnificent palaces. It grew the fashion among the higher order of his subjects to erect houses at Stanley. The Dukes of Suffolk, Buckingham, Richmond, Kent, and Bridgewater, the Earls of Surrey, Winchelsea, Middleton, and Berry, and Mr. Molesworth particularly distinguished themselves by the splendor of their palaces amongst many others. But what gave a prodigious increase to this noble city was the erection of the Senate House. That noble building which is now the admiration of all Europe was the masterpiece of the celebrated Moor. The front is certainly one of the finest pieces of architecture in the world. It was finished in 1913. The same year the Parliament assembled in it, and here I cannot help quoting a passage in their address, as the praise it contains was perfectly merited by this great monarch. Assembled in this edifice, which is one of the many works of Your Majesty's magnificence and princely encouragement of the arts and sciences, we cannot omit congratulating Your Majesty on the completion of so noble a monument of your grandeur in the nation's glory. And we return, Your Majesty, our most dutiful acknowledgments for so splendid a mark of your esteem for your Parliament, which led you to erect so magnificent a Senate House out of your private revenue. We join the rest of Your Majesty's subjects in expressing our admiration for your royal and princely virtues. Your noble encouragement of the arts and sciences added a fresh luster to the title of hero, which Your Majesty's great actions had before most justly conferred. This session voted the king a million sterling for the Senate House, and granted five hundred thousand pounds a year till His Majesty's building should be finished. Nothing could exceed the magnificence of Gilbert's plan for this glorious city. The houses were all built to form one general front on each side of every street. Nothing was used but Portland stone. The streets were broad, well paved, and the buildings not too high. Many noble squares were marked out and some finished. The theatre was the work of His Majesty himself, who drew the plan, and showing it to Gilbert, that great man told the king it had not a single fault. But this compliment had not sincerity enough in it. It certainly contains some blemishes, but it is undoubtedly a work of genius. The three centuries before His Majesty's reign did not produce so fine a building. Its simplicity and grandeur are admirable. The Academy of Painting was another institution which would have rendered the memory of any monarch dear to the arts and sciences. It was reserved for the age of George the Sixth to be graced with a list of great artists in this country, whose works should render their own names as well as his immortal. From the foundation of the English monarchy to the age of George, Britain had never seen a painter that could rank with the first class of foreign artists. Footnote. This is rather hard on Reynolds and Gainsborough, both well-known men by 1763. End footnote. But though this great king could not create, yet he drew by his encouragements and rewards artists from their retirements and set them to work. No genius ever met with even a rebuke from George. Merit was sure to be rewarded. The excellence in any art the certain road to fortune. Gilbert was the architect of the building, and its grandeur is well known. The president of this academy had a salary of two thousand pounds a year, ten seats each five hundred, and forty young artists were maintained and had apartments allotted them with pensions of one hundred pounds a year each. 
nothing was ever better planned to promote the progress of this delightful art, and its success in England under this reign was accordingly prodigious. Nicholson, an English artist, and one whose name will forever stand foremost in the list of painters, was president of the academy. Besides this appointment he was loaded with riches and created a baronet. The Battle of the Angels in the saloon of the palace which this great man painted is second to no picture in the world. Tompkins, Vere, and Norton were all English artists and not inferior to the celebrated Italians of the age of Leo X. The first was equal to Correggio himself, and the last exceeded Domenicino and Guido. Who does not glow with ardor at the remembrance of the works of these divine masters? Who does not regret their loss? They are gone, and have left but few behind them that can pretend to any degree of competition. The other artists that had seats in the academy are well known. Simpson painted the Jupiter Olympius in the saloon of Apollo, a picture which would alone have immortalized him. The most splendid court in Europe was sure to be attended with a multitude of foreign artists. Spinoza, Martelliat, and Carviante were received in the most distinguished manner by the king and had each pensions of five hundred pounds granted them, besides being liberally paid for their works. Never was any art so much obliged to a sovereign as that of painting to George the Sixth. The palace itself, which has for so many years been the delight and wonder of Britain, was finished in 1915, eight years after its foundation. Never was any building raised so expeditiously. It was indeed astonishing. But the king, sparing no expense, Gilbert finished this superb edifice in so short a time, by means of the infinite number of hands he kept constantly employed on it. It would be endless to describe this amazing pile of building, and it has already been done in all the languages of Europe. The famous Escorial of Philip II of Spain, and Versailles of Louis the Fourteenth of France, of both which we read such pompous accounts, were infinitely exceeded by Stanley. The shell of the building alone cost the king above eight millions sterling. The adorning and furnishing it was the work of above fifty years, and the expense infinite. The ceilings and apartments were painted by Nicholson, Tompkins, Vere, Norton, and many other celebrated artists. The king had no sooner begun to build than he sent connoisseurs through all Europe to collect paintings, statues, rarities, books, and manuscripts, and in these commissions he spared no expense. He even dispatched ambassadors to Constantinople and throughout all Asia to make collections. And always choosing the properest men for executing his commands, he succeeded better than any monarch that ever attempted to tread in his footsteps. The palace of Stanley thus became the repository of all the curiosities which the world afforded. No wonder his palace became so celebrated and drew such numbers of foreigners into England, when the collection of pictures and statues it contained were almost equal in value and number of capital pieces to what remained throughout all Europe, and his library contained above 1,300,000 valuable books and manuscripts. This glorious building was not only the residence of royalty, but might properly be called the Temple of the Muses. In his hours of relaxation from business the king here conversed with Reynolds, that great genius, who united the elegance of Mason and the genius of Shakespeare, with Young, whose comedies far exceeded those of the celebrated Simons, with Pine, who to the inventive imagination of Milton added the correctness and harmony of Pope. What a memorable epic was it in history when a George the Sixth conversed with three great poets in a palace built by Gilbert and painted by Nicholson. But an event happened that for a while turned off the attention of the king from these sublime employments. End of chapter 4 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 5 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 A.D. 1917-1918 Russians and French attack the Empire Battle of Augsburg Battle of Lutzen Siege of Vienna. George the Sixth assists the Emperor Frederick. Famous March. Battle of Vienna. Russians and French driven out of Germany. George attacks France and enters Paris. Battle of Maloon. Chapter 6. 1919-1920.
When we consider the dispositions of the three principal sovereigns at this period on the continent, it will not appear wonderful that the peace between them should not be lasting. The ambition of Peter, the cunning policy of Charles, and the weakness of Frederick form such contrasts as must necessarily produce no long friendships among them. The Emperor of Russia, ever restless and weary of peace, looked with envious eyes on the fair provinces of Germany. The weakness of the reigning emperor gave him a fair opportunity to attempt the execution of his schemes. He entered into a negotiation with Charles, which ended in a treaty aimed at Frederick. It was agreed that Mecklenburg, Pomerania, and some other of the northern provinces should be conquered and ceded to Peter, and the southern Austrian duchies to Charles. This flagrant treaty was no sooner signed than pretenses were sought for to break with the unsuspecting Frederick. Between ambitious princes these are seldom waited long. It would be endless to repeat even the titles of the memorials, answers, and rejoinders that were published between the parties. But the emperor, finding his enemies were determined to attack him, prepared for his defence. The Duke of Saxony, his general, collected his troops and found himself at the head of seventy thousand men. With these he marched against the King of France, who at the head of near one hundred thousand men had begun the war. The Duke attacked the King near Augsburg, and after a desperate and bloody battle defeated him. Footnote. September 14th. 1917. End footnote. This victory stopped the progress of the French arms, and enabled the Duke to direct his march towards Brandenburg, which was being overrun by the Russians. Peter, at the head of ninety thousand men, had taken Berlin, and two other Russian armies were making a rapid progress. The Duke of Saxony, with his victorious army, made flying marches to repel these invaders. It was not long before he had an opportunity of fighting the Tsar. About four o'clock in the morning the two armies joined battle in the very plain where Gustavus Adolphus the Great fought the Battle of Lutzen. Success hung quivering over each army for a considerable time. At last the Duke was killed, and his death was followed by the total defeat of his whole army. Footnote. October 11th, 1917. This great victory was hardly gained when Peter was informed that his ally, the King of France, had recovered his late disgrace by gaining a signal victory over the electors of Hanover and Bavaria, who with fifty thousand men had taken arms in defense of the empire. Frederick's affairs were now fast advancing to ruin. The Russians on one side and the French on the other pressed him so hard that he determined with a strong garrison and plenty of provisions to shut himself up in Vienna one of the strongest cities in Europe. He sent ambassadors to George the Sixth to implore his protection, and after seeing his enemies in possession of his dominions, shut himself up in his capital, which Peter with one hundred and fifty thousand men immediately invested. The King of England, who panted for glory when honor pointed out the path, was now moved by humanity. He pitied the condition of the unhappy emperor and determined to assist him. He laid before the Parliament, ever ready to concur with their monarch in prosecuting the interest and honor of their country, the state of Europe, displayed the sad situation of the House of Brandenburg and asked their concurrence in supporting it. The wishes of the whole kingdom attended the king in this demand, and the commons having granted the necessary supplies, George increased his forces to eighty thousand men, while his fleet was manned and ready for service in case of necessity. Very soon after, a vast fleet of transports wafted the king, at the head of sixty thousand of the bravest troops in the world, to the coast of Flanders. Had the emperor been in a less critical situation, he could have drawn one of his enemies off by marching to Paris. But nothing could save Frederick except raising the siege of Vienna. George therefore lost no time, but began a long and dangerous march through a country wholly possessed by the enemy. He had with him a vast train of artillery and a multitude of baggage wagons, yet thus encumbered, he ventured on one of the most dangerous expeditions that ever was known. All the passes, quite from Flanders to Austria, were in the hands of the French and Russians. He had many fortresses to pass by, and a prodigious number of rivers to cross. Yet all these difficulties, so far from slackening the activity of the king, served only to spur him more eagerly on. The particulars of this celebrated march are well known. 
George, almost without the loss of a man, arrived in Austria on the banks of the Danube, after one of the most expeditious marches ever known. He slipped by three armies whose only business was to intercept him. He passed every river in safety, and to the astonishment of all the world, was in a condition to fight the Tsar of Muscovy almost as soon as that monarch had heard of his approach. Peter immediately raised the siege, and drawing up his forces in the plains of Vienna, prepared to fight the King of England, who was also engaged in the same employment. The Russian army had a superiority of above sixty thousand men. Consequently their numbers were two to one, but no dangers could depress the heart of George. Having with moving batteries secured the rear and wings of his army from being surrounded, he placed his artillery in the most advantageous manner, and dividing his front into two lines, at the head of the first he began the attack, after his artillery had played on the enemy an hour, with great success. The Russian infantry, animated by the presence of their Tsar, under whom they had so often conquered, repulsed him with some loss. The king hereupon made a second and still more furious attack, but yet without success. At that critical moment the Duke of Devonshire, who commanded his left wing, sent for immediate assistance, as he was hard-pressed by the superior numbers of the enemy. George flew like lightning to his weakened troops, and placing himself at the head of six regiments of dragoons, made such a furious attack on the eager Russians, as threw them into disorder, and following his advantage pushed them with great success. Thus having given his left time to rally and renew the attack, he returned to the centre where his presence was equally wanted. The Tsar, having repulsed his two first attacks, and finding the English at a stand, not knowing the reason, made a most violent and well-directed assault on them, which being repulsed he renewed it with still greater vigour. The King of England coming up at that moment, and placing himself at the head of fifteen thousand horse, attacked the centre of the Russian army with such irresistible impetuosity that he bore down all before him. Every effort the Tsar could make proved ineffectual. The King, pursuing his success, renewed his attacks on the broken enemy, which threw their whole army into the utmost confusion. The Tsar ordered a retreat, but it was made in miserable order. The King dispatched the Duke of Devonshire to pursue the enemy with thirty thousand men, who made a prodigious slaughter, the vast numbers of the Russians only increasing their confusion. Footnote. May twentieth, 1918. In footnote. Thus did this magnanimous monarch gain this glorious victory against double his own number, over some of the best troops in Europe, who had been used to victory. Never could George show more distinguishing proofs of a most heroic courage than the king in this great day. This victory was thoroughly complete. Thirty-five thousand Russians were left dead in the field of battle, twenty-four thousand made prisoners, and thirteen thousand wounded. In short, the Tsar, before he arrived in Denmark, had lost above eighty thousand men, a loss in one battle almost unparalleled. The trophies were two hundred pieces of brass cannon, besides colours, and drums, etc., without number, and their military chest was taken, containing above thirty millions of roubles, a prodigious sum. But the greatness of the king's victory was best seen in its consequences. The Emperor Frederick embraced him as his deliverer, and Germany was entirely cleared of both Russians and French. For Charles, on the news of the Battle of Vienna, which was like a thunderbolt to him, had abandoned all his hasty acquisitions, and retired into France to prepare for King George's reception, as he every day expected an attack. Nor was he mistaken. The king had no sooner seen the emperor firm on his late tottering throne, than he directed his march toward France, determining to punish Charles for his unjust attack on Frederick. He met with no opposition, and entered France as he would have entered England. In three weeks the whole Duchy of Lorraine was subdued, and Reims opened its gates to the conqueror. George advanced towards Paris with hasty marches, the court in the greatest terror retired to Orléans, and on the 6th of September, 1918, the King of England entered Paris at the head of his victorious army. The whole French nation were astonished at the success of George, and a general despondency ensued everywhere but in the breast of Charles. That prince was in the neighborhood of Lyon, at the head of a powerful army, but in doubt whether he should fight the English or no. His very crown was at stake. A defeat must inevitably strip him of his dominions, 
and, on the other hand, a pusillanimous conduct could not but sink the spirits of his people still lower, and be attended with perhaps as fatal consequences. But the rapid success of the King of England hardly allowed him time to think. That monarch had divided his army into two parts. With one he was overrunning Normandy, while the Duke of Devonshire with the other was conquering Picardy, the Isle of France, and Champagne. By the end of October all the northern provinces of France were in the hands of the English. In the meantime Charles had increased his army to one hundred and thirty thousand men, but the greater part were but indifferently disciplined. A large body of French troops were in the service of the King of Venice, and were now on their march home. But without staying for these, Charles advanced towards Paris. George immediately collected his forces and prudently entrenched himself in a very advantageous spot. Here the King of France attacked him and fought in that desperate manner which might be expected from a brave man whose kingdom was at stake. But the genius of George prevailed. The English cannon were placed so advantageously, and so well served, that every attack the French could make served but to increase the prodigious number of their slain. Charles at last drew off his men from the attack, when the King of England, letting loose ten thousand horse on the weakened and almost vanquished enemy, completed his victory with the total defeat of the French. Footnote. November 7th, 1918. End footnote. Orléans, Brittany, and Burgundy were immediately overrun by the English troops. But winter coming on, the king left the command in France to the Duke of Devonshire, and crossing the water landed in England, where he was received by all his expecting subjects with the loudest acclamations of unfeigned joy. End of chapter 5 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 6 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 to A Forecast Written in the Year 1763 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, A.D. 1919-1920 to War Renewed, Siege and Relief of Orléans, The King Wounded, Battle of Arlo, Battle of Alençon, Death of King Charles, George re-enters Paris, leaves France, and returns to England. The King of England, who thought he had done nothing while he had anything to do, was soon in France. His troops, having enjoyed every necessary refreshment, were collected very early in the spring and rendezvoused in the neighborhood of Paris. Charles, on his side, did everything that industry, artifice, or bravery could effect, to retrieve the terrible condition of his affairs. He had applied to the court of Madrid for succors, and had met with success. The king of Spain furnished him with money, and by his great vigilance he had collected his army as soon as his enemy. George opened the campaign by besieging Orléans, a city of the greatest importance, and Charles determined to attempt relieving it. He formed a scheme for surprising the king in his entrenchments. One dark night, about twelve o'clock, he advanced with near thirty thousand men through a hollow way which led to the king's lines. By some well-conducted motions he cut off the advanced guards, and knocking down several sentinels made a vigorous attack on the English entrenchments. The troops, unprepared for action, ran hastily to their arms. The king flew to the quarter where Charles made his attack, and found General Shipton at the head of four regiments which were by that time half-formed, sustaining the vigorous efforts of the French. He rallied and formed his men as fast as possible, but with all the coolness imaginable. No effort was left untried by our young monarch to repulse the enemy. He drove them back twice, but still they renewed the attack. At last George, unfortunately, was wounded in the side by a musket-ball, and carried off the field. No other stroke could be half so despairing to his troops. They gave way almost immediately but yet the Earl of Berry retired with tolerable good order. The English commanders greatly distinguished themselves in this action, particularly the Earl who conducted the retreat. Footnote. May 7, 1919. End footnote. Charles fought with the greatest bravery and led on his troops with the most heroic firmness. He showed equal conduct and courage in the scheming and executing his plan. He revived by this action the spirits of his whole kingdom. It was indeed no inconsiderable honour to triumph over the King of England, though the wound that young hero received was Charles' best friend. 
but the victory greatly raised his reputation. The English were obliged to raise the siege immediately, and the king was carried to Mayenne. His wound was not dangerous, but was not likely to be healed soon. Nothing could exceed the sorrow of the whole army at this unhappy accident. They loved the king as a father, and never fought under him but with an eager certainty of victory. All his dominions wept on receiving the news, and offered up the most fervent prayers to heaven for his recovery. The Duke of Devonshire commanded a small army in Paris, and hearing of the king's defeat was at some difficulty to know how to proceed. Charles was on the full march to his capital, and his troops were too few to oppose him, yet he could not quit the city without orders. However, he soon received them from the king to join the troops under the Earl of Berry. It was with some difficulty that he effected this, for Charles was bent on making him and his whole army prisoners. But slipping by him, he made three forced marches and joined the royal army, of which he then took the command. Touraine, Berry, Nivernois, the Isle of France, Champagne, and part of Normandy were soon overrun by the French troops. Charles found his army was increased to near two hundred thousand men in high spirits at his late victory. But what chiefly increased his reputation was the possession of Paris. Flushed at the fair appearance his affairs wore, he thought of giving battle to the Duke of Devonshire before George was well enough to command in person. His generals, indeed, all advised him against the scheme, and represented to him that the English army would decrease every day, that his subjects were so inspirited with his late success, that they would rise against his enemies wherever they still possessed the command, but that in hazarding a battle he put all his advantages to the stake at once, and at a time when defeat must be attended with the most fatal consequences. These representations had little effect on Charles. Impatient for a complete victory, he collected one hundred and twenty thousand men, and at the head of that vast army began his march to attack the English. The king had been some days removed to Cain, when he was informed of the motions of Charles. He sent immediate orders to the Duke of Devonshire to fortify himself in the strongest manner, and to choose the best situation for a camp for that purpose. His grace obeyed the command without delay, and fixed on an admirable situation at Conlee. Footnote. Oddly enough, Conlee was to see a great camp in the nineteenth century. It was the place chosen for the mobilization of the Breton Guard Mobile in the autumn of 1870 during the Franco-German War. In footnote. He soon rendered his camp impregnable, and was at the same time able to receive all sorts of supplies from the country behind him. The Earl of Berry, with eight thousand men, was at Alençon, and General Villiers, with ten thousand, at Rennes, so that the three armies formed a line which perfectly secured them. On the 3rd of June, footnote, 1919, end footnote, Charles arrived in sight of the English camp, but was surprised to find out how admirably everything was disposed for his reception. He found it was impossible to attack the Duke with the least prospect of success. He assaulted several of his posts, but always met such a reception as convinced him that nothing could be effected. He turned off towards Paris after this ineffectual march, and laid siege to Chartres, a strong fortress and nearer to the capital than any other in the hands of the English. The King of France had hardly undertaken the siege before he had intelligence of an event which both obliged him to raise it and gave him great uneasiness. General Summers had commanded an army of twenty thousand English in Flanders from the opening of the war. Charles had lately detached the Marquis de Senetraire at the head of forty thousand men to give him battle, or prevent his joining the Duke of Devonshire, as he had made some motions which indicated a design to undertake that dangerous expedition. Senetraire, with all the rashness of a young soldier, for he was but twenty-two, attacked Summers in his strong entrenchments and after a sharp engagement was totally defeated. The English general made the best use of so fortunate an affair. The battle was fought near Arlot, and quitting the field he made a flying march with his victorious troops to Amiens. From thence he fled toward Rouen, when the King of France, being alarmed at the celerity of his marches, determined to raise the siege of Chartres, and hastened himself to meet him. George, whose wound now began to heal, was in pain for his brave general, and finding himself pretty well recovered, resolved to place himself at the head of his army. 
He was advised against it by his surgeons, but in vain. The impetuosity of his courage could not be stopped, and he arrived at the camp the twenty-ninth of June. He immediately drew his forces out of their entrenchments, and calling in the detachments commanded by the Earl of Berry and General Villiers, he again found himself at the head of a gallant army of seventy thousand men in good spirits, and who longed to wipe off their late disgrace. Charles had marched to Bretoul to intercept Summers, and he had stationed his troops in so judicious a manner that the Englishmen could not pass him. The King of England, having drawn in all his scattered troops, moved toward the French King, who prepared to receive him in the most vigorous manner. It was plainly foreseen that a general engagement must quickly ensue, for Charles drew up his army to the amount of one hundred and twenty thousand men in order of battle on the plains of Alençon. George came in sight of him the 4th of July, and prepared that night to give him battle. The French army was posted in the most advantageous manner. In their front was a rivulet, behind which were nine redoubts mounted with cannon. Their wings were defended in the same manner, and every approach guarded with artillery. The king, having reconnoitred the enemy's position, drew up his troops on the same plain at some distance in their front. As the French army outspread his, he disposed his cannon in his wings in such a manner as to prevent his being surrounded. Himself commanded the centre, the Duke of Devonshire the right, and the Earl of Berry the left. Everything being prepared for the engagement, the king ordered the signal to be made for beginning it. And about nine in the morning that battle began, which at once was to decide the fate of two mighty kingdoms. The French army was the most numerous and commanded by their king. The monarch of the English also headed them, and they were eager to engage and obliterate by their bravery the memory of their late defeat. The fire of the artillery was the beginning of this great action. As the British troops advanced under cover of their own cannon, that of the enemy played on them with great fury and some effect. But the skill of the English engineers so well directed their fire that several batteries of the enemy were thrown into confusion. The king, however, soon brought on warmer work. At the head of the first line of his centre he began the attack which was received with firmness. The Earl of Berry at the same time with the left fell on the right of the French. For about an hour the success of the day was doubtful, but the right of the English army then beginning the attack threw the French into a little confusion. Charles, however, flying with great celerity from his centre, repulsed the Duke of Devonshire and attacked him in his turn, drawing off a part of his centre to sustain his left. The Duke repelled his attack, but it was renewed with such vigour that he found it necessary to send an aide-de-camp to the King for assistance. George drew twenty battalions from his centre, and all his horse from his left. This was a most masterfully and rapid motion. Just as the Duke was thinking of a retreat, the King came up at the head of his fresh troops. The field of battle was now almost changed. The French had been so often repulsed in their attacks that it was even dangerous to pursue their advantage after the great loss they had suffered. But Charles, contrary to the advice of his generals, renewed his attack after George was arrived. The French troops, fatigued with fighting almost three hours in a hot day, made but a faint impression. The king easily repulsed them, and placing himself at the head of his cavalry, made a most furious attack on his almost defeated enemies. Nothing resisted him. The whole French army was broke through in a moment, and the slaughter that ensued was terrible. While the king burst through every battalion of French with the irresistible fury of his cavalry, General Young brought up sixty pieces of cannon which played on their broken troops near an hour. All the efforts of Charles were in vain. The battle was lost beyond the power of recovery. And to complete the misfortunes of the French, their king, as he was endeavouring to rally his men, was killed by a cannonball. The Earl of Berry, with twenty thousand men, pursued the flying enemy and made a vast multitude of prisoners. Never was any battle more critically won. The English army was on the point of being defeated, which would certainly have been its fate had not the king recovered all, by one of the most masterly strokes of generalship recorded in history. Never was there a braver soldier or a more complete commander. Both characters he equally displayed in this celebrated battle. He received a slight wound in his left arm, and had three horses killed under him, and during the whole action exposed his person in the hottest fire. In killed and wounded he lost seven thousand men. 
but what is remarkable, not one officer of great note. The French nation never sustained a more terrible blow, never one more decisive. Besides the king, they lost 32,000 men killed, 9,000 wounded, and 12,000 prisoners, in all 53,000, an amazing number, among whom were the princes of Condé and Charleroi of the royal blood, the dukes of St. Omer, Rochefoucauld, Ventador, Amiens, and Dielu, many other nobility of great rank, thirteen lieutenant generals and five major generals, all killed. Among the prisoners were the dukes of Bordeaux, Rennes, St. Clair, Doyne, the Marshal Suivione, and three major generals, besides many others of rank. One hundred and fifty pieces of cannon, seventy mortars, and all the baggage of the army, with drums, standards, and colors without number being taken. But the prodigious consequences of this victory best proved its decisiveness. The road was open to Paris. George, at the head of his victorious army, took it. His detachments overrun the whole province of Orléanois, even to Nevers. He himself made a triumphant entry into Paris, and Philip the Seventh, the new French king, hardly reigned in his capital before he was obliged to fly from it. All Picardy was immediately conquered. The English themselves were amazed at the rapidity of their own success. Montargis, Saint, Troyes, and Auxerre opened their gates to the conqueror. The strongest fortresses held out but a few days, so universal was the terror which spread over all France. They had no prospect of relief. King Charles, who just before the Battle of Alençon, which robbed him of his crown and his life, saw himself at the head of two hundred thousand men, left a successor who had not even ten thousand about his own person, and yet half France was in his possession. But the English prosecuted their success with so much vigor that every moment brought him tidings of their conquests. The rapidity with which George followed his blow surprised all Europe. By the beginning of August he was in the entire possession of Normandy, Brittany, the whole province of Orléanois, the Isle of France, Champagne, Picardy, and Flanders. He had small detachments making important conquests in other provinces. The Duke of Devonshire acted in Lorraine, the Earl of Berry in Burgundy, General Summers in Hainault, and General Villiers watched the motions of Philip, who had retired to Lyon. Thus the English were in possession of near half France. These wonderful successes, while they called to mind the remote days of Edward the Third and Henry the Fifth, yet totally eclipsed them, and though a very great share of admiration was paid to the names of those celebrated heroes, a degree considerably higher attended the name of George. The heroic monarch who was at Paris found himself much disordered after his late fatigues. His wound had not received sufficient indulgence to complete a cure, so that his physicians by all means advised him to return for a short time to England, and repose himself after the vast fatigues he had undergone. The king, who found himself very indifferent, followed their advice, and leaving the command in France to the Duke of Devonshire with orders to prosecute the war with the utmost vigor, he left that kingdom and arrived at London the 1st of September, 1919. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 7 of the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925. A forecast written in the year 1763. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, A.D. 1919 to 1920. Foreign Affairs. Spain and Russia intervene in the war. Treaty of Madrid. Preparations in Great Britain. Parliament meets. An Allied army mobilized in Switzerland. Duke of Devonshire conquers Flanders and Holland. George could not have left France at a more critical time. His prodigious successes had kindled the jealousy of several of his neighbors, who wished to see the rapidity of his conquests stopped. A series of victories had raised his character as a commander to an extreme high pitch. He possessed the reputation of not only being the greatest general of his time, but even one of the most celebrated that ever existed. He was the sovereign of a powerful kingdom, and was equally formidable both by sea and land. He had given France a terrible blow by one successful battle, and bid fair to conquer the whole kingdom in another campaign. 
these circumstances at the same time that they raised the jealousy of his neighbors equally occasioned a dread of his power all wished to clip his soaring wings but no one singly dared to attempt it his old enemy the czar peter was engaged in a second war with the turkish emperor bajazet which had been carried on with various success for two campaigns and a late rebellion of the Danes under Count Stormer had obliged him to divide his land forces. Yet engaged as he was, he was ready to come into any alliance against the King of Great Britain. Indeed, he could no longer be the enemy he formerly proved, for the Russian fleet, as its rise was swift, so its declension was rapid, and powerful as Peter had lately been at sea, yet he was now by no means in a condition of making any naval opposition of consequence to the fleets of England. Charles V, who at this time sat on the throne of Spain, was a weak prince, but governed by the Count de Leon, a minister of great abilities and unbounded ambition. From the moment George distinguished himself on the continent of Europe, he became his enemy professed, and by his intrigues endeavoured to unite the whole of Europe against him. He had supplied the late King of France with immense sums of money, he had put the whole force of Spain in motion, and waited only for a proper opportunity to declare openly against the King of Great Britain. Spain was in a flourishing condition. The acquisition of Portugal and Brazil was very considerable, and having been so fortunate as to possess a succession of able ministers, her revenues were in good order, and her forces well disciplined and numerous. She had a fleet of forty sail of the line ready manned besides frigates. Italy at this time enjoyed a profound peace, the kings of Sicily and Venice having for some time compromised all their disputes. The Emperor Frederick the Ninth was in close alliance with George, and the German princes neutral, but ready to let their troops to whoever would hire them. The Swiss cantons were also in friendship with Great Britain. Footnote. Stevenson, Volume 1, page 63, in footnote. Such was the state of Europe when the Battle of Alençon struck a terror into most of its sovereigns. The Count de Leon had some time before entered into a negotiation with the Tsar to form an alliance against George. This battle hastened their proceedings, and a treaty was soon agreed on between them for the protection of Philip and signed at Madrid. Peter engaged to join the Spanish fleet with sixty sail of the line and to send ten thousand foot and five thousand horse to assist Philip. Spain was to march an army of sixty thousand men into France to act against the English. In return, Philip engaged, as soon as George was driven out of his dominions, to assist Charles with all his forces, and to recover Milan from the King of Sicily. Footnote. Was this for the benefit of the King of Venice? or was Spain dreaming of recovering Milan, lost since 1712? End footnote. The last article was secret, but his Sicilian majesty found means to come at the designs of his enemies. The 1st of October the King of Spain declared war against Great Britain, and on the 9th he was followed by the Tsar. George, in the meantime, was not dilatory in opposing both preparations and negotiations against those of his enemies. He no sooner arrived in England than he dispatched orders to Milford for a squadron of twenty ships of the line and fourteen frigates to be equipped with all expedition, another of ten sail and eleven frigates at Portsmouth, twenty line of battleships and nine frigates at Hull, fifteen sail were almost ready for sea at Plymouth, nine at Cork in Ireland, and five in Lynn. In all, seventy-nine sail of the line besides frigates. He had a squadron of fifteen sail off Toulon, under Admiral Tonson, and ten in the channel commanded by Phillips. The Duke of Grafton hastened down to Hull to quicken the preparations for fitting out the Grand Squadron, which was to sail for the Baltic from thence. Orders were given for the fleets at Plymouth, Portsmouth, and Lynn, with the squadron in the channel, to rendezvous at Hull as fast as they were got ready for service, that a powerful fleet might sail from thence early in the spring, before a Russian one could come out of the Baltic. Never were such prodigious preparations carried on in a more spirited manner. New ships were building at all the ports of Great Britain and Ireland, and even in the immense colonies of America. Four ships of forty guns each were on the stocks at Quebec, ten at Boston, and five at Philadelphia. Nor was the king's attention only carried towards his navy, 
Twenty new regiments were raised in Great Britain and eight in Ireland. All sorts of military preparations went on with equal vigor. The Parliament meeting in the beginning of winter, the session was opened with a very sensible speech from the throne, in which His Majesty laid before them the state of affairs both at home and abroad. He explained the necessity of prosecuting the war in the most vigorous manner, and repelling all attacks that might be made by the members of the alliance which was formed against him. There were two parties at this time in the Parliament. The one was for making a peace as soon as possible, to avoid a war with all Europe. These urged that the conquests His Majesty had made in France, however glorious they might seem, were certainly contrary to the interest of the kingdom, as it would be highly absurd to think of keeping them, even if it was in our power. This was their chief argument, and the Duke of Bedford, who was in disgrace, was at their head. But as the opposite party, who were entirely guided by the pleasure of the king, so great was his reputation, and so universal was the good opinion entertained of him, were much the strongest, after a few debates, it was determined to address his majesty and to thank him for his design of prosecuting the war with vigor. And before they were prorogued, they granted him thirteen millions, every shilling of which was raised by taxes within the year, to the surprise of all Europe, so extensive was the British trade at the time. His Majesty's negotiations were as spirited as his military preparations. He sent the Earl of Chesterfield as ambassador to the Emperor Frederick, the Duke of Marlborough to the King of Sicily, and Mr. Wharton to the States of Switzerland. A treaty was soon signed between himself, the Emperor, and his Sicilian Majesty, in opposition to the alliance. Frederick engaged to attack the Russians if they entered the empire, and George took ten thousand of his men into his pay. The king of Sicily furnished him with ten thousand more at his own expense, on condition that they should be recalled if that monarch was attacked himself, and that the king of Great Britain should send an army of twenty thousand men to his assistance. Moreover, George hired eight thousand Bavarians and six thousand Swiss infantry. Such were the measures this vigilant monarch took to repulse the attempts of his powerful enemies. No sooner was these treaties signed than the ten thousand troops furnished by the King of Sicily marched from the neighborhood of Turin, and crossing the Alps near Bornico, joined the Swiss troops and remained in camp till the Imperialists and Bavarians arrived, when they formed an army of thirty-four thousand men. Footnote. This is an unintelligible march. Does the author mean Bormio? If so, the army followed the Valtelleri route. But this would be a bad one for reaching Zurich, its ultimate goal. Perhaps Jornico is meant, and the St. Goddard line was taken. End footnote. The king sent the Duke of Devonshire orders to detach the Earl of Berry with five thousand men, to put himself at their head and lead them into France. This was no easy task. Philip, who had recruited his army and was reinforced with fifteen thousand Spaniards, lay in his way to intercept him. French Comte, part of Lorraine and Alsace, were in his possession, so that the road to Switzerland was entirely blocked up. But this able general deceived the French king, or, rather, the Marshal Saletta, who had the command, and making a flying march passed by his army and entered Switzerland in safety. The Allied troops were in the neighborhood of Zurich, Barry placing himself at their head, entered French Comte without opposition, for Saletta was too weak, though far superior in numbers, to prevent him. Perceiving the weakness of the enemy, Barry laid siege to Besançon, expecting an easy conquest, but a brave governor commanding in it, he was obliged to open the trenches against it. In the meantime, his grace of Devonshire was not idle. He had collected forty thousand men to drive Philip from Lyon and attack that city, but an unforeseen event changed his design. General Summers, who commanded 10,000 men in Hainault, was unfortunately surprised in a dark night by a small body of the enemy's troops in that province, and the Frenchman pursuing his blow was attended with some success. This affair called off the attention of the Duke from the southern parts, and pointed out the necessity of first reducing all the northern provinces. Instead, therefore, of marching to Lyon, he moved with his army towards Flanders. The French troops, although elated with their success, did not dare to stand their ground. Their commander very prudently gave up all thoughts of keeping the field against the Duke, and conjecturing that his grace would not make so long a march without attempting to reduce the country, 
he divided his troops into small parties, and threw them into the strong towns in the Flemish provinces. The sea-coast was already in the hands of the English, quite to Blankenburg, with the whole province of Artois. Devonshire, being joined by General Summers and his scattered troops, divided his army into two parts, with one Summers advanced toward Namur, with the design to take that city, and afterwards to reduce all the adjacent provinces. The Duke at the head of the other made a flying march to Antwerp, and surprised that city. His detachments, by the way, conquered all Dutch Brabant, and Dutch Flanders. This country, so famous in history, was no longer the strongest spot in Europe. Many of that vast list of fortresses, which in the great Marlborough's day took so much time to master, now opened their gates to the Duke of Devonshire on the first summons. Having secured the provinces in his rear, he advanced into Liege, and coasting along the Moes, took Nimogen. Nothing now opposed the most rapid conquests. Whole provinces were overrun in a few days. The French garrisons in Holland were weak to the last degree, and the Dutch, whose spirits were sunk in their slavery, had no inclination to assist their cruel masters. Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht, and even Amsterdam itself, opened its gates to the conqueror. In one word, all the seven provinces were in the hands of the English by the end of the campaign, December 1919 to January 1920. General Summers had no less success in his expedition. Namur surrendered in five days, and Luxembourg, part of Champagne and Lorraine, were immediately conquered. This prodigious success struck a damp into George's enemies. While Philip was lying inactive and waiting for reinforcements, the English had conquered an immense territory and were every day extending their possessions. The Duke, leaving twenty thousand men under Summers to take up their quarters in the conquered country, returned with the rest of his army to winter in Paris. End of chapter 7 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 8 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 a forecast written in the year 1763. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, A.D. 1920. Naval victories over the Russians. Duke of Lerma marches into France. Motions of the British and French armies. Celebrated march to saint Flour. Philip arrives at Paris. Battle of Espalion. Battle of Paris. The conquest of France. Conquest of Mexico, Philippine Islands reduced, Duke of Devonshire enters Spain, General Peace signed at Paris November the 1st, 1920. The enterprising disposition of George would not suffer him to defer opening the campaign the moment he was able. In the beginning of April, footnote, 1920, footnote, the Duke of Grafton sailed from Hull with sixty ships of the line and thirty-five frigates to the mouth of the Baltic he soon learned that the Russian fleet was not even collected. Thirty sail of the line were anchored off Stockholm in expectation of being joined by twenty more from Petersburg, when they were ready to rendezvous at Copenhagen, where twenty sail were ready for the sea. Footnote. This reads very like the state of affairs in the Baltic in 1801, when Nelson made his great stroke to keep apart the squadrons isolated at Stockholm, Kronstadt, and Copenhagen. In footnote. The Duke no sooner gained this intelligence than he immediately entered the Baltic, and steering towards Stockholm designed to fall on the Russian fleet before they had advice of his approach. He executed his scheme with all imaginable success. In a dark night he sent in six fire-ships among their squadron. The effect was terrible and fatal to the enemy. Eleven ships of the line were burnt, and seven frigates, four sunk and seven taken, the rest were greatly damaged and totally dispersed. This decisive blow, which at once disabled the enemy from appearing at sea during the war, was a thunderbolt to Peter, who was then with his army overrunning Denmark, which had rebelled against him. However, rather to make a parade of power than in hopes of retrieving the misfortune, he gave orders that the loss should be instantly repaired, and all endeavors seemed to be directed to raising his navy. But it was in vain. The Duke of Grafton, following his blow, sailed to Petersburg. He bombarded the city three days to the other ruin of everything but the fortifications, and by a bold and well-conducted attempt he landed three thousand men to attack the fort that defended the basin. 
It was carried in a moment, and this glorious expedition ended with burning the whole Russian fleet of twenty sail, after a defense, indeed, which did great honor to the enemy's courage. After two such decisive strokes, the presence of the Duke was no longer necessary in the Baltic. He left it, and setting sail for England, anchored at Hull with his victorious fleet. The King, with his own hand, wrote a most friendly letter to the Duke, thanking him for his great and eminent services, particularly in this signal success. He soon after ordered him to sail for the coast of Spain, and gave him orders to annoy the enemy in whatever manner should seem best to himself. He was limited only to the coast of that kingdom. His Majesty, before he left England, gave orders for a fleet of ten sail of the line and eight frigates, to sail for the West Indies to prosecute the war in that part of the world. They were to convoy transports, with three thousand infantry on board, who were designed to attack Mexico under General Cannon. These were to land at New Orleans. Footnote. An odd place to choose for landing to attack Mexico, but our author's geography is not at its best in America. End footnote. The fleet was commanded by Admiral Newport. Another squadron was ordered to be got ready with all expedition for the East Indies to attack the Spanish possessions in that quarter under Admiral Clinton. The preparations of the king had been prodigious, yet ships were still wanting and were fitting out every day. It was indeed surprising how this active monarch could give his attention equally to every object of such a prodigious extensive war. Before the Duke of Grafton had destroyed the Russian fleet, George was landed in France. He carried with him eight regiments of foot and three of dragoons, which had been but lately raised. He found the Duke of Devonshire drawing his troops out of their winter quarters, and collected them near Nevers. This business the king hastened with all expedition, for he designed to take the field before the Spanish army under the Duke of Lerma had joined Philip. It consisted of fifty thousand men, and was in full march for France. Philip himself had spared no pains to augment his troops. He had thrown strong garrisons into all his fortresses, and his army designed for the field amounted to seventy thousand men, which he was collecting with all expedition. The King of England, by the latter end of April, found himself at the head of sixty thousand conquering troops. He had besides twenty thousand in garrisons, twenty thousand in Flanders under Summers, and five thousand in camp near Santez, commanded by General Young, who watched ten thousand of Philip's troops that had been detached to penetrate into Orleanois, but without effect. Dijon, Mecon, and Bourg were now the only places in Burgundy in the possession of the French. George detached ten thousand men under General Cleveland to reduce those fortresses, which it was expected would prove an easy task, as the two first were cut off from all communication with Philip's army. After performing this service, he was to join the king in the neighborhood of Lyon. His Majesty on the 3rd of May left Nevers, and marched to Moulin. The governor, Du Roquet, deserted it at his approach. The king, leaving a garrison in it, directed his march to Bourbon, with the design to reduce all the places on the Loire, and joining General Cleveland lay siege to Lyon, which he made no doubt would draw Philip to a battle, as the loss of that city would be fatal to his affairs. Footnote. Duchong, Tome, six, page forty-seven, in footnote. This excellent plan showed the genius of the king, and the execution was equal to the design. By a happy expedition, which always threw his enemy into confusion, George became master of Dijon, Semier, Boisset, and a strong fort which commanded an important pass at Tarare, which opened him the road to Lyon. General Cleveland had met with equal success in his expedition. Philip detached two thousand men to oppose him, but the English general, by making a flying march, deceived him, and conquered the three towns almost as soon as he had attacked them. Footnote. Dijon, Macon, and Bourg. End footnote. Having thus performed the chief end of his expedition, he marched to join his master with little or no opposition, and effected it with his little loss. The French were but spectators of their enemy's success. The King of France, who was guided in all his military operations by Marshal Saleta, was terrified at the sudden approach of his victorious enemy. The Duke of Lerma had not yet entered France. He was perplexed what course to take. 
determined not to hazard a battle, he was in great fear of the king's attacking Lyon. There was in that city a garrison of eight thousand men, yet he depended but little on their defense. If he encamped under its walls, he knew it would be safe, but then it would be in George's power to cut off his junction with the Spanish army. On the contrary, if he marched towards Spain to join it, Lyon he gave up as lost, and perhaps other places of great importance might partake its fate. Thus confused between different opinions, he at last was guided by his general, who urged him to entrench himself strongly under the walls of Lyon. As George, he supposed, through his impetuosity, would aim at taking him and his army prisoners, and would neglect to cut off his communication with Spain. George, whose camp was near Boissy, immediately perceived the oversight of the enemy. He took no time to spend in tedious consideration, but seeing that the whole fortune of the war depended on his preventing the junction of the French and Spaniards, he determined to exert every effort to cut off all their communications. There was the greater necessity for expedition, as the Duke of Lerma had entered France and was arriving at Foix. Footnote. An unlikely point for him to appear at is it would seem that he must have crossed the Pyrenees at one of their least accessible points in order to reach it. He would really have marched by Figueras and Perpignan. In footnote. The scheme was difficult to execute, for all the country before him was full of strong towns with garrisons in them. His plan was to march to saint Fleur, but Riom, Clermont, and Issois lay so near his road that it would be extremely difficult to pass without reducing them. Without losing a moment's time, therefore, he made a flying march to Riom, and presenting himself before it, required the governor to surrender immediately at discretion. Terrified at George's approach, he surrendered without firing a gun, but his cowardice, however, cost him dear for he was afterwards shot for his behavior by the command of his master. George, having thrown a garrison into Riom, marched with no less expedition to Clermont, and expecting the same speedy success. But the prince of that name, being lord of the town, commanded in it, and returned a haughty answer to George. His majesty immediately surrounded the town, and at night about ten o'clock made three violent attacks on it in different quarters. Never was action more obstinately fought, but some scaling ladders breaking at the principal attack, and the bravery of the French throwing his men into confusion, he was obliged to draw off his troops with the loss of two thousand five hundred men. The king, who expected that Philip would march with all expedition to join the Spanish army in time, resolved to lose none, and quitting the attack on Clermont, determined, as Riom was in his possession, to pass on without it. His Majesty, using the same expedition, advanced to Issois, which to his utter astonishment he found deserted. Pursuing his march, therefore, he arrived at saint Fleur, and was hardly in sight of the town before he ordered it to be attacked. The fury of this attack, which was made at once in five places, only seemed to raise the courage of the governor. But nothing could resist the English. After four hours' hot action, they carried it by storm. This celebrated march which was one of the most expeditious ever known, was performed in eight days, a rapidity that was astonishing. The king, by such prodigious celerity, however, prevented the two armies of French and Spaniards from joining. He expected, indeed, that Philip would take a different course as fast as possible to effect the junction, but herein he was mistaken. Philip, or rather Saletta, no sooner saw how far George had got the start of him, than he perceived the extreme difficulty of joining the Spaniards, and knowing that the operation of the whole campaign must be greatly retarded by waiting for the Duke of Lerma, he determined to make a resolute push to recover the capital in the northern provinces of his kingdom. The attempt must necessarily be attended with great difficulty, but he was nevertheless determined in his resolution. Had it been possible, he would have taken the straight road to Paris but the English possessed a multitude of garrisons in his way that rendered such a march impracticable. Therefore, breaking up his camp with very little noise, he took the route of Bourg, designing to make a great detour through French Comte and Champagne. Bourg surrendered without a blow. From thence he marched with great expedition to Dole. His plan in this march was the same as that of George in his southern one. He determined to leave every town behind him that made any great resistance. The governor of Dole refused to surrender, 
and Philip, despairing of taking it by storm, passed on to Langray. The officer who commanded there had not the same courage, but left the town an easy conquest to the French. Cezanne gave him as little trouble, from whence, after a very rapid march, he arrived at Paris, which was never able to resist an army. May ninth, 1920. Nothing could raise the spirits of his subjects more than this stroke. He expected to be soon master of all the northern provinces, as he depended on the Duke of Lerma's finding the King of England employment in the south. But we shall leave him here a little while to take a view of the operations between George and the Spaniards. The Duke had advanced to Toulouse, and hearing that Philip was marching to Paris, he exclaimed against this perfidy of the French in the highest terms. He reproached them with breaking their engagements, as they were to join him and to act in concert with his army. The Spanish minister was no less loud in his complaints, but it was too late for Philip to change his plan, and the Duke, with all possible caution, advanced to Toulouse. He knew the genius of the man that commanded against him, and was determined to leave nothing to fortune, to hazard no action of consequence but to keep advancing and find the King of England an employment, while Philip was overrunning the northern provinces. His plan was the most prudent he could have chosen, and he had a genius proper to execute it. When he arrived at that city he learned of George's being at Mende, upon which he still advanced to Albi and Rodet, and from the situation of the king was in hopes of being able to make a flying march, and yet join Philip. But the king of Great Britain knew it was impossible for the duke to take advantage of his motion, from the situation of his outposts, the passes of which were all in his command. Lerma was at Espalion, and just as his army was beginning to move, one of his aides de camp brought him intelligence that the king was at Albrock in his front, but four miles from him. Alarmed at this news and dreading a battle, he instantly ordered his troops to arms, and they moved forthwith into their camp, at the same time receiving orders to raise new entrenchments and redoubts. The king had made this sudden and rapid motion with a design to bring on a battle, judging it a favorable opportunity when the Spaniards were on the march. However, finding that the duke was taking every precaution that was possible, he gave over the design, and the two armies continued in the same position a week, during which time George was incessantly attacking the out-parties and convoys of the duke, and trying to provoke him to a battle. But it was in vain, for the cautious Spaniard kept close in his camp, and very quietly saw the king victorious in every skirmish. But this petit guerre was the king's aversion, though he understood it well. He loved hazardous actions in which fortune played a part. He was tired if a continued series of battles, rapid marches, or town storm did not succeed quickly to each other, never more pleased or more calm than in the midst of all. As may be supposed, this disposition made him long for an engagement with the Spaniards, and form a variety of projects to bring one about, but knowing the prudent enemy he had to deal with, he determined to surprise him by night. Previous to the execution of his project, he had detached parties to secure all the country round him. The Earl of Berry, with twenty thousand men, had taken Orlac, Figeac, Cahors, and Villefranche, so that all the country behind him was secure, and the enemy possessed the route by which they advanced. Having prepared everything by calling in all his detachments the better to deceive the Duke, he gave out that he should march immediately to succour Rouen, which was besieged by the French king. He accordingly provided a vast quantity of baggage, ammunition, and artillery wagons, pressed all the horses of the country into his service, and in short gave directions in such a manner that every one fully believed he was on the point of departing. When the day came on which he meditated the attack, the 23rd of June, the troops were all directed to wait for orders, and it was expected that the next morning they would begin their march. But about ten o'clock they were all drawn up in order of battle and George, dividing them into two bodies, placed one under the command of the Duke of Devonshire, and headed the other himself. The Duke was to make a little detour of a mile and a half through some woods which led to the Spanish camp, while the King himself took the same direction through the plain. Both parties were to meet and make the attack in concert. Nothing could be executed in a better order. The troops, to their great surprise, filed off without the beat of drum or sound of trumpet, and by half an hour after eleven arrived at the very verge of the enemy's camp. The king, joining his forces and giving orders to the duke, the Earl of Berry, and General Young, who were to command the three attacks, while himself overlooked all at the head of a chosen body of troops, directed them to advance, 
with orders not to fire a musket till they were in the midst of the camp. The three divisions moved at the same instant, and had advanced a considerable way into the camp before they were discovered, the Spaniards being all asleep in their tents. A grenadier attempted to knock down a sentinel, was resisted, whereupon he fired at him, and the noise immediately aroused some contiguous tents, who upon this spread a general alarm and ran half-naked to their arms, but found the English advancing to the very centre of their camp. They attempted to resist, but were broken dispersed in an instant. The Duke of Lerma himself by this time was at the head of a confused party, and attempting to form them. But five-and-twenty field-pieces which the king had brought with him were placed so advantageously that every attempt of such a nature was ineffectual. The Duke flew like lightning through his camp to bring his men to some order. All the Spanish generals exerted themselves, but their stand was momentary. Terror stalked before the English wherever they moved. Nothing could resist the impetuosity of their attacks. All was one scene of horror and confusion. The enemy was everywhere dispersed in the utmost disorder about their camp, and cut to pieces in regiments. To complete the carnage, the Earl of Berry, turning the cannon of three redoubts on the flying troops, mowed them down in squadrons. By break of day the action was over. The whole Spanish army was totally dispersed with incredible slaughter, and the loss of their general, who was killed in the confusion that necessarily attended such an action. Never was victory more complete. Twenty-two thousand Spaniards were killed and ten thousand made prisoners. All their camp baggage and artillery, standards, colors, drums, and other trophies without number were taken, besides their military chest. They suffered great loss in their retreat, so that out of fifty thousand who came out, scarce ten thousand returned to their own country. This decisive victory was a fatal stroke to Spain, and almost ruined Philip's affairs. The news of it was as a thunderbolt to him. After gaining so great a victory in such advantageous circumstances and with the most trifling loss, there was nothing to stop the rapidity of the king's conquests. He divided his army into three divisions, and all Languedoc, Provence, Dauphiné, Gascon, Guienne, Quercy, Perigord, Limousine, and Saintonge were conquered comprehending near four hundred miles of territory. But it is time to take a view of Philip's operations which will exhibit a very different picture. He was no sooner master of Paris than he marched into Normandy and laid siege to Rouen, expecting to be master of it in a few days. But his hopes of such speedy success were blasted, for he found the brave governor, General Stanley, returned a haughty answer to his demand of surrendering but as it was absolutely necessary that the city should be taken before he attempted anything farther, and as no time was to be lost, he opened nine batteries against it at once, in expectation of obliging the governor to surrender by the fury of his fire. But after a week's dreadful cannonade he was not nearer his point than when he first began the attack. With much vexation he was at last obliged to open the trenches, and a slow siege could not but be fatal to his affairs. Yet he trusted to the Duke of Lerma's keeping George engaged till he was master of it. In this situation he continued his approaches for some time, but saw little prospect of his being able to carry the city. At last advice was brought that the King of England had totally defeated the Spaniards, a terrible blow to Philip. He was at first struck dumb with surprise, but recovering himself ordered the siege to be raised immediately and falling back to Paris, entrenched his army under the walls of his capital. Every day brought him accounts of whole provinces overrun by George, and seeing that his affairs were on the brink of ruin, he determined to sue for peace, and accordingly sent two ambassadors to the British monarch. But he was answered that it was now too late for a peace, that France had been the aggressor in the war, and that he must expect no other terms but those his sword procured him. His Majesty quickly followed this answer with all his forces. He left Rodet in the beginning of July, and moved with great expedition towards Paris. Footnote. The Battle of Espalion was fought on June 23rd. The King moved on Paris about July the 5th. How did he find time in ten days to conquer Provence, Languedoc, and the other remote provinces? The chronology needs recasting. End footnote. In fifteen days he reached its neighborhood, and encamping at Dampierre, 
went immediately to reconnoiter Philip's entrenchments. Saletta had done everything in his power to make them as strong as possible, but their extent rendered them weak, although they contained eighty thousand men entrenched to the teeth. George, drawing nearer, determined to attack them without delay. He pointed out three places to his generals at which to make the principal efforts. At one he commanded himself, and the Duke of Devonshire and the Earl of Berry the other two. The prodigious boldness of the attempt made some advise the king against it, but his ardent temper made him reject their opinion. It was expected that this action would be one of the bloodiest ever fought. The king made the attack at three o'clock in the morning of the 24th of July, but it could hardly be called a battle. In half an hour the whole French army gave way. Dispirited by so many defeats and engaging in expectation of being conquered, instead of fighting like men, they fled like sheep. Philip, with the Dauphin, his brother on one side of him and Saletta on the other, attempted to rally his men. But it was impossible, and in the flight he was taken prisoner by the Earl of Berry, to whom he delivered his sword. The Dauphin was also taken, and Marshal Saletta. The loss of the French amounted to about fifteen thousand men in killed and prisoners, and the whole army was totally dispersed. This victory threw the whole kingdom of France into George's possession. He had now no long marches to make, his enemy had no resource. All was lost. From the frontiers of Spain to the extremities of Holland the whole territory was in his hands. The king of Spain, or rather his haughty minister, was seized with terror. They repented having provoked a prince, whom they were in fear would take a severe revenge. All Europe trembled at the name of George, and it was next to evident that he was now become invincible. But the same success attended his arms in the remotest corners of the world. We before mentioned the Duke of Grafton sailing with his victorious fleet to the coast of Spain. His grace's actions on that station were not so brilliant as those in the Baltic, but almost equally ruinous to the Spaniards. Too weak to face the English squadron, the Spanish fleet kept in port. Thirty sail of the line besides frigates and other ships were at anchor in the harbor of Cadiz. The Duke, finding there was no probability of the enemy's venturing out, formed the design of attacking the forts of the city, and burning the Spanish fleet. There was a vastness in all this nobleman's schemes that showed a great and daring genius. During the reign of George the Third, admirals watched the fleets of their enemies and spent whole months ineffectually, and yet that was a brilliant period. But now in the age of George the Sixth, the British admirals did not watch, but forced the ports of their enemies. The Duke executed his plan with great success. With the loss of only one ship, he burnt nine sail of the line, fifteen frigates, and sixty-four merchantmen. He then entered the Straits, and falling in with a small Spanish squadron, took from Alicant to Gibraltar, to take in their guns, he took four sail of the line and three frigates, dispersing the rest. Footnote. Gibraltar then was no longer in British hands, but a Spanish arsenal. Presumably it had been lost during the unfortunate wars of George V. In footnote. In the West Indies, Admiral Newport met with yet greater successes. Having landed General Cannon and his men at New Orleans, he sailed to the island of Cuba, and without any assistance reduced it. That immense island once more came under the dominion of Great Britain, and with it a prodigious sugar trade. Footnote. Havana had been in our hands in 1762 at the end of the Seven Years' War, but was surrendered at the peace of 1763. End footnote. The general, having collected the troops of the colony of Louisiana to the amount of 15,000 men, began a very long march toward Mexico. Footnote. An incredible way of invading Mexico. Any invader with possession of the sea would have landed at Vera Cruz, as did the Americans in 1846. In footnote. But as the country through which he proceeded was tolerably well cultivated and having the advantage of conveying his artillery, etc., by several noble rivers, he soon entered the Spanish colonies. Footnote. It is difficult to see how the Rio Grande or any other stream would thus help a force marching on Mexico. All the great rivers run across, not parallel to the invader's road. In footnote. Where the weakness of their government was very visible. He met with no resistance, but proceeding on his march, arrived at the opulent city of Mexico, 
It surrendered on the first summons, and in three months he conquered the whole country, together with the Isthmus, across from La Vera Cruz to Acapulco. Nothing could be more fatal to the Spaniards than the loss of these immense regions. The trade of them was a great and valuable increase to that of Great Britain. But these operations were performed in concert with another in the East Indies. The end of Admiral Clinton's expedition was the conquest of the Philippine Islands. This fleet, being rendezvoused at Batavia, was joined by fifteen sail of the line of the company's ships, and ten thousand of their land forces. Footnote. The East India Company, then, was still in full existence in 1920, and Batavia was English. Presumably we had taken the Dutch East Indies when the French conquered Holland. In footnote. They proceeded immediately for the object of their enterprise. So great a force in that part of the world could meet with little or no resistance. Manila was taken after an attack of two hours, and all the islands were successively reduced to obedience. The government of them His Majesty entrusted to the company. The accession of wealth was immense, since these vast conquests concurred to command a vast and open trade, which was carried on almost immediately from Acapulco to Manila. In short, all the riches of the Spaniards, or their most valuable riches, their trade, for the mines of Mexico were exhausted long before, fell into the hands of the English. But events were happening in Europe which drew the attention of all the world. Footnote. In 1898 they still gave 70% of Mexico's total exports. In footnote. The King of Great Britain, no longer seeing an enemy in the field, entered Paris with great pomp and placed his headquarters in the Louvre. He sent the Duke of Devonshire at the head of 40,000 men to attack Spain and distributed 30,000 more in garrisons throughout France. The remainder of his army, which amounted to 32,000, was part encamped in the neighborhood of Paris and part distributed in that city. He had besides 20,000 more in Holland under General Summers. He left this army in the same position on account of the neighborhood of the Russians. The Tsar Peter was yet engaged in a skirmishing, tedious war with small parties of the Danes, whom he found it impossible to quell at once. Besides, he could use but a small part of his power, for he was at war with the Turks, and finding so much business on his hands, he was utterly unable to attack George. The Duke of Devonshire had no sooner passed the Apennines, footnote, a curious slip for the Pyrenees, in footnote, than he broke into Catalonia, and overrunning the whole province, sat down before Barcelona. All Spain was alarmed. Terrified at the attack, the haughty minister himself saw the immediate necessity of appeasing George. He sent ambassadors to Paris to sue for peace, who met with no very favorable reception. They made many proposals which the king rejected. At last George, in a memorial, informed their court that he would make peace on no other terms than the following. 1. That the king of Spain shall cede all the conquests of the English in the East and West Indies to Great Britain as an indemnification for the expenses of the war. Footnote. This would leave Spain South America but no other part of her colonial empire. In footnote. 2. That the King of Spain shall acknowledge the King of Great Britain as King of France. 3. That the King of Great Britain shall relinquish his conquests in Catalonia in consideration of the King of Spain ceding the island of Sardinia to Philip of France, which he shall enjoy forever with the title of King. Footnote. How and when Sardinia had become Spanish we cannot tell presumably when the Sicilians overran Italy. End footnote. For some time the court of Madrid refused to accede to these conditions, but finding the king's determination fixed and Barcelona in the Duke of Devonshire's possession, and dreading to see George at the head of his army in Spain, they at last agreed to them. The Tsar Peter and Philip were both invited to accede to the treaty, and the latter had his liberty promised him, and the island of Sardinia if he did. The difference that subsisted between Great Britain and Russia did not prove the least obstacle, and Philip, tired out with ill fortune, and seeing the impossibility of recovering either his kingdom or his liberty, agreed to the conditions prescribed by George. An English fleet wafted him, his brother, and many of the French nobility to the island of Sardinia, which he took possession of. The King of Great Britain generously made him a present of fifty thousand pounds to settle his court, and treated him during his captivity with all the politeness imaginable. The peace was no sooner signed than it was proclaimed at London and Paris, and His Majesty was crowned King of France at Reims, the 16th of November, 1920, 
before an immense concourse of British and French nobility, etc. After leaving the Duke of Devonshire to command in that kingdom, in December he embarked at Calais, and arrived in England. End of chapter 10 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 9 of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine, AD nineteen twenty one to nineteen twenty two. State of the Kingdom, the Parliament meets, Arts, Sciences, and Literature, Academy of Literature, University, Gardens of Stanley, Public Works manufactures, prosperity of the American colonies. After such great fatigue as the king had suffered in the last campaign, it may be supposed that he longed to enjoy a situation of peace and tranquillity. And it is very remarkable that no man ever knew better how to taste the hurry and noise of war, or the ease of retirement. He was equally calculated for both. But he was too good a politician to disarm himself as soon as the peace was signed a conduct which has often been fatal to conquerors. Never were measures taken with greater prudence to secure possession of the kingdom he had conquered. He knew that all Europe looked at his victories with the utmost jealousy, and sickened at the verdure of his laurels. He was fully persuaded that the late peace had only given time to his enemies to prepare more effectually for a fresh war. The Spanish monarch, at once inveterate and formidable, he foresaw would aim at a second alliance against him. Therefore, as his situation was so critical, he determined to leave as little as possible to chance, but to keep himself always ready for action. This plan was most easily executed, for although Great Britain still felt the burden of a prodigious national debt, yet the Parliament granted him very ample supplies both to carry on the war in France, and to build new ships, repair others, to sink docks, and make harbors. The King's designs on France indeed had raised some heats in the House of Commons, but these were all blown over. The vast splendor of success reconciled every mind to the measure, and what had no little influence was the economy of the King. They found that the supplies they granted were applied with the utmost fidelity to the uses they were intended. They expected at the opening of the session after their congratulatory addresses were passed to have many demands for securing the vast conquests which the King had made but they were much surprised when they found none made. The Lord High Treasurer informed them by the King's order that the establishment in France would fully support itself, and pay off all the arrears of the army. This was most agreeable news to all who feared the immense expense of keeping that kingdom. Only forty thousand men were voted, therefore, as the standing troops of Great Britain, and ten thousand in Ireland, thirty thousand seamen were demanded and agreed to without opposition, and five thousand in Ireland. The other services were all supplied with ease, cheerfulness, and alacrity. But there was one circumstance which pleased the King in this, as in some other sessions, its meeting at Stanley where he had summoned them. He there found himself in the midst of his own creation, and was never so well pleased as when he was engaged in raising noble piles of architecture, in conversing with men of genius, and planning further establishments in favor of the arts and sciences. Had the other princes of Europe been possessed of such a philosophic disposition, George would never have attacked his neighbors. He was far more pleased to be at the head of an academy at Stanley than of a victorious army conquering a great kingdom. Four years were now elapsed, footnote, 1921, in footnote, since George had been able to attend to his buildings at this noble city with that care and oversight which he desired. His residence there was but by snatches. He now and then caught a month flying, but the city was much enlarged in his absence. He had entrusted the management of the buildings to Gilbert, but every one who built houses was left at liberty in every point but the front. The sight of every street formed a regular one, and fancy itself could not form an idea of anything more truly magnificent than all the streets of Stanley. They exhibited all that was great and elegant with the utmost variety that genius could invent. And as this superb city was evidently become the metropolis of the three, or rather four, kingdoms, the streets increased prodigiously, 
Most of the nobility and gentry spent their winters at Stanley, the seat of everything that could charm the wise, the rich, and the luxurious. London was already degenerated into a mere trading capital, and the king was every day planning the removal of those offices which it was in his power to transport to his favorite city. His Majesty ordered Comins, the architect, to draw the plan of an edifice designed for the chancery. That ingenious designer brought him the sketch of the building as it now remains, but it was not equal to some other works at Stanley, nor indeed to several churches of Comins raising in which he was peculiarly excellent. Yet the chancery is a very noble building and does honor to its author. It contains immense apartments for the several courts of law. But the grand design which drew the attention of the whole kingdom was the Cathedral of St. John, now building under the care of Gilbert. That great man, whose invention perhaps was never exceeded, was indebted to nothing but his imagination for the design of that astonishing edifice. Its architecture, grander in extent, far exceeds St. Peter's at Rome, and it is certainly one of the greatest monuments of George's magnificence, and even a wonder of the world. In the year 1921, Stanley, besides this superb cathedral, contained 43 parish churches, many of them famous over the whole world for their architecture. The city had grown to be four miles in length and near as much in breadth. Among those glorious establishments which reflect so bright a luster on the reign of this great king, one of the most distinguished was the Academy of Polite Learning. It was certainly very wonderful that all the kingdoms in Europe should have their academies near four centuries before Great Britain, but George supplied the want of everything that reflected an honor on his country. This noble institution consisted of a president and of a number of members which was not fixed. The former had two thousand pounds a year and the latter three hundred each. The first creation was of twenty-three members, and perhaps no period of time can display a brighter union of geniuses. The most distinguished were Howe, whose essays, letters, discourses, and poetical pieces gained him such a great reputation both for his learning and genius. He was the president. Reynolds, whose tragedies are so famous, Young, the comic writer, Price, the author of our British epic, Miners, Wilson, and Philipson, all wrote both admirable tragedies and comedies, Walpole, whose sketches on many subjects are so elegant and pleasing, Krauss, Charlton, and Earl in history. Charlton's history of Britain was perhaps never exceeded. But it would be tedious to name all their celebrated works, which are now in everybody's hands. Never was any institution better calculated for refining the English language or for promoting literature in all its branches. The prizes which were every year given for the best tragedies, comedies, and essays on a variety of subjects, at the same time that they raised a spirit of emulation, were a means of enriching the votaries of genius. George was solely bent on rendering the city of Stanley the steed of everything that was either useful or elegant. The Duke of Suffolk, his favorite minister, hinted to him one day in conversation the foundation of a university. The king considered of the scheme, and liking a plan that would adorn the city with so many noble buildings as the colleges, determined at last to put it in execution. The Academy of Architecture furnished plans, and the king gave each member a noble opportunity of rivaling each other. The author of each plan that was approved was permitted by the king to be the architect. Nothing could excel the magnificent establishments which were made in favor of this new university. The professors, masters, etc., were all appointed with the utmost consideration. None but men of unblemished morals and great learning were advanced to any posts in it. Scholars, not only from all parts of the king's dominions, but from all Europe, flocked to be admitted in the University of Stanley, which had many advantages that could be enjoyed by no other. What still increasing their ardor was its economy. The bounty of the king made it one of the cheapest seminaries for the education of youth in the world. No plan could have ornamented Stanley with a greater number of noble edifices. All the colleges, but particularly St. George's, are admirable, and perhaps the world cannot boast such a number of buildings with so few faults. St. John's is the worst, but St. George's, of which Gilbert was the architect, is inferior to no edifice of its kind in the world. But while these celebrated piles of magnificence were raising, the king was employed some part of his time in laying out the gardens of his palace. He neglected any such additions for some years. The woods which almost surrounded him were of themselves so beautiful. 
but at last he formed the scheme of sketching gardens equal to his palace. He drew several plans himself. These amusements and employments were worthy such a monarch as George, and no man could succeed in them better. Behind the palace the vast woods of oak and beech almost joined the building. The king laid out a grass lawn to the back front half a mile long and a quarter broad, and round it to a considerable distance made it beautifully picturesque. The appearance of art was entirely banished. Nature was never forced, but assisted. He dug an immense piece of water, of one hundred acres, and raised a mountain by it, which is certainly one of the most beautiful spots in the world. By means of a prodigious quantity of masonry he formed many precipices, which in some places almost hung over the water. These were covered with mould to a great depth, and the whole hill presented the view of one beautiful hanging wood of beech, here and there adorned with a little temple or spire peeping just above the trees, which made the whole most beautifully romantic. From off the hill was seen at some distance a noble prospect, and you looked down on the lake surrounded with woods and lawns. Nothing unnatural was seen throughout the whole garden. No studied magnificence, very few fountains but many cascades, which tumbling down artificial rocks, lost themselves in meandering currents through the embrowning shades. In this beautiful garden there was scarcely one straight walk except the grand lawn above mentioned. Everything was irregular and natural. In many places sheep and other cattle were feeding, and as many foreign birds and harmless beasts as possible were procured to run about the woods which were full of hares, rabbits, and pheasants. In short, this garden, which may be considered as a work of eminent genius, was formed on the mere plan of guiding nature. The grass was almost everywhere kept in excellent order, but the woods had no other improvement but the intermixing of the most beautiful flowering shrubs irregularly amongst the trees, and instead of letting the surface be generally flat, hills and a thousand imperceptible variations were made to render it more pleasing. The water naturally ran in one channel, but the king threw it into many, and it fell down a variety of cascades, but all without any appearance of art. Never was anything on the whole more beautiful or more truly picturesque. These gardens, which were about five miles in circuit, may be considered as the finest in the world, and far beyond those celebrated ones of Versailles, of which historians speak so highly. But it was at the same time highly to this great king's honor that his amusements did not encroach on his more important occupations. George was not only magnificent but humane. His attention to those establishments that only advanced the national glory did not call him off from such as were dictated merely by his benevolence and humanity. The unhappy found in him their best comforter, the poor and needy their surest support. At the time that he was raising palaces and founding academies, hospitals of all kinds were reared with liberality and magnificence throughout the kingdom. The scheme and execution of the country hospitals were the effects of his goodness, nay, the very plan was his own thought. Whatever county would raise half the necessary sum for any of those seminaries of the poor or miserable, the king granted the other half. Happy nation, to have such amiable qualities mixed with the more dazzling brightness of their monarch's mind. Twenty foundling hospitals were erected at his sole expense in different parts of Great Britain and Ireland. The hint of these useful foundations was taken from one that was established for a few years in the reign of George the Second, but it came to nothing for want of proper care. However, those raised by the king proved to be, and now continue, most excellent establishments. Before the year 1925 His Majesty had built, and either wholly or in part endowed, thirty-five hospitals. Nothing was omitted by George that added to the strength and security of his kingdom which he considered equally with its ornament. Vast works were raised at all the seaport towns in Great Britain and Ireland to defend the coast from all insult. Docks for building ships were made at every place where there was a sufficient depth of water. New men of war were constantly building in them and old ones repairing, so that he was at all times prepared to wage war on any sudden emergency. Vast arsenals and magazines were erected at all the most distinguished harbors, Plymouth, Milford, Chatham, Hall, Edinburgh, footnote, this does not argue much topographical knowledge of the Scottish capital, but Leith is no doubt meant, in footnote, and Cork, might separately be considered as real wonders of strength and greatness, 
each of them was capable of fitting out a greater fleet than any single kingdom in the world. Besides these, there were many ports of less consequence for the building and rendezvous of small men of war and frigates. The coasts of the two islands were almost entirely surrounded with works which were at once their ornament and defense. Rivers that formerly were almost useless were now navigated by large barges which increased the trade of innumerable towns and raised in many places new ones. Canals were cut which joined rivers and formed a communication from one part of the kingdom to the other. The spirit of trade attended these prodigious works. Villages grew into towns and towns became cities. An infinite number of manufactures flourished all over the kingdom. None were so inconsiderable as not to enjoy the king's patronage, who examined into the minutest branches, and by the vast and penetrating capacity of his genius, attained a full comprehension of most arts. He understood their interests, and knew when and how to promote them. By these means he raised and supported them at a small expense, and did as much real service to trade with one hundred thousand pounds, as many princes and even great ones have performed with treble the sum. But the immense region of country which the English possessed in North America was what most extended and forwarded the British manufactures. The king was their sovereign of a tract of much greater extent than all Europe. The constitution of the several divisions of that vast monarchy was admirably designed to keep the whole in continual dependence on the mother country. There were eleven millions of souls in the British North American dominions in the year 1920. Footnote. In 1899 the population of Canada and the United States is about 75 million. End footnote. They were in possession of perhaps the finest country in the world, and yet had never made the least attempt to shake off the authority of Great Britain. Indeed, the multiplicity of governments which prevailed over the whole country, the various constitutions of them, rendered the execution of such a scheme absolutely impossible. Footnote. Sad words to read when we consider that the colonies were to be goaded into revolt within fifteen years, and to be an independent state ere twenty had elapsed. In footnote. This wide extended region which increased its people so surprisingly fast was far from being forgot by the king. Many noble harbors were surrounded with towns and made naval magazines. A prodigious number of ships were built by order from Great Britain, and the Royal Navy itself boasted many very fine vessels that were launched in America. In a word, this was the Augustan age of Great Britain. The fictitious times which received their being only from the imagination of poets were realized in this happy country. It seldom or never happens that a period in which military glory is carried to its greatest height is also the age of happiness and plenty. But this was the case in the reign of George the Sixth. Britain, at this golden era, was at once glorious and happy. End of chapter 9 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 10 of the reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925 to 1925. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. A.D. 1922 to 1925. George the Sixth visits France. Government in France. New laws. Buildings. Encouragement of arts and sciences. George gives both freedom and happiness to France. Fini. A truly benevolent disposition knows no bounds to see the desire of diffusing happiness. George the Sixth longed to see France in possession of that ease and plenty which were now the distinguished characteristics of Great Britain. The Duke of Devonshire, it is true, had governed in that kingdom with abilities and integrity, but it was not in his power to execute the designs of the king, nor was his genius adapted to the business. His Majesty determined, therefore, to make a trip thither, and to increase the splendor of his court, he took with him great part of the nobility of the kingdom. On his arrival at Paris he fixed his residence at the Louvre, but was disappointed in finding that very few of the first nobility of France waited on him. His court was crowded with Frenchmen, but not men of great importance. George could not condemn this mark of their affection for their former sovereign, but like a wise and benevolent prince resolved to conquer their disaffection by his clemency and the mildness of his government. The kings of France had been absolute monarchs for many centuries. The Parliament of Paris had formerly raised commotions in the kingdom by their obstinacy in refusing to register the royal edicts. 
but this appearance of liberty was now entirely at an end. George determined to make the French love him, and he knew that would be impossible if he did not give them more happiness than his predecessors, and make them no longer regret the loss of their former kings. His management in France was certainly admirable. At the same time that he secured himself against all insurrections, he gratified the conquered people. He raised many French regiments. He promoted a multitude of French officers in English and German corps. He made a mixture of the two nations in almost everything except religion, but he never shocked the people with any innovations in that tender point. He had indeed long laid the plan of rooting superstition and enthusiasm out of the kingdom, but never thought of changing the established religion. By an edict which was registered in Parliament, he gave all his French subjects the privilege of both reading and publishing any books with the same limitations as in England. This edict contained the substance of the English laws on that head, and was declared irrevocable. It is difficult to conceive the effect which this change had at Paris. A sullen silence had reigned throughout the kingdom, but almost at once it was succeeded by a boundless torrent of flattery and invective. The king looked on with calmness, and was highly satisfied at the pleasure the whole nation experienced in this new liberty. A multitude of indirect libels on him were printed, but many ingenious men defended George, and gave him excessive praise for this instance of his clemency and philosophic disposition. The lower people were shocked at the great number of books that swarmed from the press which ridiculed and subverted the Roman Catholic religion. But the sensible part of the nation rejoiced to find that no subject was so sacred as to bar common sense from the consideration of it. Every man published his sentiments with the utmost freedom on all subjects. The king, who had a sublime notion of morals and religion, ordered a vast number of the best English books to be translated into French, and printed at the Louvre. Those spread with the other publications over all France opened the eyes of the more sensible, and even awakened some of the ignorant, to a sense of the absurdities of popery. The Abbe de Mancière, particularly by His Majesty's directions, composed a most elaborate dissertation to prove that monasteries and nunneries were most pernicious to the state. The king seemed an enemy to no part of religion but that which was prejudicial to the civil state of the kingdom. This noble freedom which the French had so long lost gave rise to a thousand useful and excellent treatises, both in morals and politics. All other arts were also benefited by it. But it was not in this article alone that George showed his desire of making the conquered nation happy. By an edict which will be immortal, he introduced the laws of England into France with no changes, but such as respected religion and his own authority. He even gave up every prerogative which he did not possess in England, except the raising of money. Parting with that would have been dangerous so soon after his possession. As the French nation had always preserved a notion of liberty, and had never fallen absolutely into slavery, the effect of these changes was surprising. They seemed to enjoy them with particular exultation, as they came from the hand of their conqueror. Happy for France that it was conquered by such a patriotic king. The only set of men who at first appeared discontented with these changes was the nobility. They were no longer the absolute lords on their own estates they had heretofore been. The meanest peasant was now free and could not suffer but by judgment of his peers. But in return for the loss of that power which it was dishonorable to use, they had many noble privileges confirmed to them unknown to their ancestors. They were no longer the slaves of their monarch, and the first to bear his fury. The king himself had no more authority over them than over the lowest mechanic. How unusual was it in France to see uncorrupt judges going the circuits of the provinces who enjoyed their salaries fixed for life, and had no inducement to favor either side. During this residence in France, so happy for the kingdom, the king built a very noble palace at Fontainebleau. Footnote. Apparently our author is ignorant of the very noble palace already existing there since the time of Francis I. In footnote. And another on the banks of the Rhone. He also repaired the Louvre and many other public buildings, and neglected nothing that could add to the ornament of the kingdom. The fortifications of the frontier towns from the north of Holland to the Mediterranean, which had in many provinces fallen into decay, were repaired and even augmented. The royal ports were filled with workmen of all sorts. 
Great numbers of ships from men of war to merchantmen were built. His Majesty's Navy was continually augmenting, and as the two nations now possessed an immense trade, there was no danger of ever finding a scarcity of sailors. The monarch who in England had been so great and magnificent a protector of the arts and sciences, acted worthy of himself in France. The French nation had enjoyed more establishments in favor of literature, such as academies, than Great Britain. But they were in general only honorary. Men of the greatest genius were often members of many academies, but almost starving for want. George therefore found no want of fresh establishments, but only the fixing certain salaries on the seats of those already in being. This he did with a liberality unknown in France, and greatly to his honor. Few conquerors were ever celebrated for such excellencies as this great monarch. The panegyrics on him, which were numerous and just, did not turn on his victories, but his philosophic disposition and his civil virtues. Prejudice and partiality, which so often throw a veil over the real characters of princes, can find few faults with this great king's administration. His conduct, especially in France, has been blamed by many politicians, but no philosophers. In fact, George ought rather to be considered as a philosophical king than a consummate politician. He had too many virtues to shine greatly in the latter character. Yet those men who have blamed so much the political conduct of the king in giving liberty to a great kingdom speak merely as politicians. But George's memory will outlast every reflection of this nature, and virtue will triumph in spite of the most scandalous misrepresentation. In some instances his conduct was certainly faulty, but he never committed an error which did not proceed from a good motive. However, the strongest proof of the excellence of all his opinions is the universal praise that is bestowed on his memory by all foreign historians. His name was as dear to France as it was to Great Britain. Fortunate nations to possess a king formed by nature to make the world he governed happy. End of chapter 10 End of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925, to a forecast written in the year 1763, by Samuel Madden. Recording by Philip Gould.